Okay, so it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. What do we have? Where has my... <laughs> um, and to share with you some of the findings uh, from the research that has been going on in Oxford and with companies around the world for the last two decades or so. Uh, I am a experimental psychologist by training. I'm not a food designer, I'm not a chef, nor a food technologist. Um, but we work with food technologists, chefs, and designers around everyday experience. Um, and over the years, over the last 25 years, that has taken us from various applied domains from driving, from the design of signals for car drivers, uh, through the world of touch. This book published in 2014 with Alberto Galacci from uh, Milan, in fact, uh, all about how technology uh, of touch is changing uh, 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 the way we, we interact with the world and find out about it. But uh, increasingly, over the last 10, 15 years, our research has focused much more on the world of food and of drink, um, both at the high end and for the mainstream. So, for example, in uh, 2014, we published a book, The Perfect Me, uh, trying to understand what makes life's best food experiences, looking at some of the top chefs who deliver those amazing once-in-a-lifetime experiences and trying to study them as psychologists to understand what makes them special and then share the insights with food producers, with baristas, with cocktail makers uh, in order to nudge all of our food experiences in a better direction. Uh, I should say uh, all these slides are available. I was hoping you'd have the slides beforehand to go along with but uh, a PDF will be sent out afterwards. Um, and all 99% of the research I'll share with you has been uh, peer reviewed and is published somewhere. And I'm happy to share any of those papers uh, uh, with you if you are interested and cannot find. So we're, we're inspired by the topic. We all uh, run a lab in Oxford in the psychology department that is funded by the food and beverage industry. Um, and hence, we also work a lot in this book from 2016, uh, from the fundamental neuroscience to the marketplace via the brain of the consumer, thinking about how they see, hear, taste, and uh, smell the world around them. And finally, uh, the book you've just seen, Gastrophysics, the New Science of Eating, uh, published last year and in about 15 languages since, not Italian. Maybe your food culture is too strong uh, uh, for that. Which, as we'll see, is a shame because the la whole last chapter is, is dedicated to the Italian futurists. Uh, F.T. Marinetti and his ilk will be popping up time again through the next few hours. Um, and this is uh, an attempt really to capture uh, the excitement around our growing understanding of the senses and to move the sort of scientific discourse around food experience design uh, from the kitchen, because I think we've had three decades of molecular gastronomy, modernist cuisine, call it what you will, but it's the science of spumes and foams and gelling agents of new machines in the kitchen, rotovaps and anti-griddles and sous vide perhaps. But all the science has been brought to food production at the very high end through uh, molecular gastronomy. Um, but all the science has been there in the kitchen. And me as a psychologist, I'm more interested in the diner, the person who uh, eats the food. And that's the whole aim behind gastrophysica, uh, a combination of gastronomy on the one side and psychophysics, a branch of psychology on the other. So I put the, put the gastro in the title because I am interested in the nice food experiences, the beautiful, the memorable, 
the once in a lifetime. Dishes like this from a chef who runs Kitchen Theory in London. A young chef uh, who's interested in delivering dining experiences through all the senses, building on the latest in technology and in the neuroscience. And doing so with kind of a social message in the background, this um, uh, vanilla and the bee, uh, the last course in a tasting menu that had nine courses of which six involved insects. And here with the chef trying to nudge diners to try insects, but do so in a way that's visually stunning and appealing, that looks beautiful and builds on the psychological principles. So we're interested in the high end, and this is to kind of distinguish us from scientists who uh, do study science and food perception, but tend to be focused much more on frozen chicken breasts or bags of Brussels sprouts. And they have participants who come into the testing center and test you know, um, frozen chicken every Monday morning for a year as you vary the production methods and see how much fish meal you can feed the chicken before you can taste it on the breast. This is science and food together, and there are many people who do a very good job of that. We're not going to there, but more take inspiration from the high end of food. Um, as I said, I'm not a chef nor a designer. Um, so what we bring to the table, as it were, is the science of measurement, the science of the mind of the person tasting. And in a number of the examples I will tell you about, we kind of combine research in the laboratory. Here we have, we're interested in the wine glass. Is it worth paying $100 for a wine glass and a different wine glass for each grape variety? And if there is a difference to be had by changing the wine glass, does it reside in the chemistry or the volatiles in the glass? All out of the psychology of the, of the drinker. And here we have a subject. They can't see the glass. They can't touch the glass. The glass is agitated on a stand to release the uh, 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 aromas. Does it make a difference? In this case, the wine glass makes no difference at all to people's rating of wine, time and time and time again. This is, of course, not how we actually taste wine. We actually hold the glass, we see the glass, we know things about what that glass um, entails. But the fact that with our eyes closed and not touching, we can't tell the difference, says that the difference that wine glasses make is happening up here, not uh, here or in the headspace, I think. So this is scientific measurement science of, of, of fine wine, uh, fine glassware. But this person is not enjoying the food. It's ecologically invalid. This person is probably an undergraduate, a student, probably studying psychology. We call them weirdos, Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic uh, boys and girls who make up most of psychology. So as well as doing this research, which is scientific but not ecologically valid, we do this kind of research in the real world, in restaurants, cafes, coffee shops, cocktail bars, food festivals, music festivals, literature festivals, anywhere we can to get lots of people and give them something to eat uh, and see what factors influence their experience. And if I can show that the wine glass matters here, and it matters in the restaurant, that's perfect. Because this is ecologically valid. It's real world, it's noisy, you're celebrating your birthday, it's sunny or it is not. All sorts of things could affect your performance. So it's ecologically valid, but not very scientifically controlled. And our aim, when we can, is to do both the lab and the real world research around the mind of the diner. Um, okay. And why? You might say, why do we need a new science? I, I haven't heard of gastrophysics before, and our food is wonderful, is it not? As it is, why do we need somebody new coming along telling us we have to learn new stuff, do things differently? Uh, the answer, I think, comes down to, in a way, this dish you see here, which was served at the soon-to-be world's top restaurant, the Fat Duck in Bray, uh, three star restaurant run by chef Heston Blumenthal. Uh, and new dishes, before they go on to the tasting menu, 
are trialed in the test kitchen. Does it work? Well, let's, let's allow the top chef to season the food to perfection. Can we scale for our uh, dinner guests? And then it's trialed in the restaurant with regular diners. So here is a dish that the world's top chef thought was perfectly seasoned. He brings it out to his regular loyal dinner guests. And what do they do? They go, ugh, ugh, it's really salty. They don't like it, it's way too salty. The top chef in the world thought it was perfect. His diners think it is not. What is going on? Uh, and I think the answer here is not to be found in the, the ingredient list here, but it's all in the mind and what was different in the mind of the chef and the diner. Because when we see this, our minds immediately make a prediction. Our brains have evolved to find and forage food, and within the blink of an eye, as soon as you saw that image, your brain had decided, do I like it or not? Is it nutritious or not? Is it energy dense or not? Would I have to go to the gym after eating such a big scoop? All happens in the blink of an eye. And most people on seeing this dish think strawberry ice cream or maybe raspberry, something like that. A red berry fruit, it will be sweet. I like it, not so healthy, but I want some. In this case, it turned out to be uh, actually a frozen crab bisque ice cream or smoked salmon ice cream. The color is perfect, entirely natural. It's just not what the diners expected. The chef knew it was a historic savory ice. The diners thought it was going to be sweet. And that difference in expectations in the mind of the two people leads to the different experience. And this is just one example, and it starts the, the, the gastrophysics book, forwarded by the chef Heston Blumenthal, uh, to suggest that the pleasures of the table really reside up here, not down here in the mouth. Sort of doesn't make sense, because we all think, we all feel, experience the flavors in our mouth, the food moving around between our teeth. And yet, the smell, the sight, the texture, the temperature cues, the sound of food, all of those sensory inputs come together for the first time in your brain, not in your mouth. Your mouth only gives you sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. In this case, what should, what's the top chef to do? It turns out that by a simple act of naming, uh, you can improve diner's perception of the dish. If you call it, here, try the savory historic ice cream. Or if you say, this is food 386. Something that sounds like astronaut food, food 386. What kind of name is that for an ice cream? But it's enough of a name for you to say, hold on, that can't just be strawberry ice cream. Why has it got that title? And if you change the name, diners trying the dish think it's perfectly seasoned. They enjoy it then, and they enjoy it thereafter. And for me, kind of the version of this was going to Japan 20 years ago, seeing green ice cream on the streets, not being able to read the labels. It was hot. I, I pointed and I got some ice cream, thinking it was going to be um, pistachio or mint. I tasted it, and it was green tea. Green tea ice cream, not at all what I expected, and that powerful disconfirmation of expectation stayed with me now 20 years later. Whenever I am served Japanese green tea ice cream, as I was last week in Japan, I can't help but reference the first exposure, which was negatively valenced. Um, so this is a dish in a high-end restaurant. Most of you, most people, in fact, have never had the chance to eat there. So you might say, well, this was a problem for the chef, but why do I care? Um, because the fat duck is expensive, esoteric, exclusive, and quite a long way from Milan. But our hope in working with chefs like uh, Heston Blumenthal and on occasion Ferran Adria and other world top chefs is that they're the Formula One of food design, of innovation, of experience design around food. And some of what they do percolates down to the mainstream sooner or later. And innovation happens faster here in these uh, high-end kitchens than I think it does in many food company research labs. 
At least that has been our experience. So what's the evidence that this kind of insight, the power of naming, trickles down to the mainstream? Uh, I'll give you two. Uh, my favorite, and again in the book, of the power of simply changing the name of a dish to nudge diners, to nudge consumers in a different direction, comes from the, Chilean, uh, the Patagonian toothfish, which has been on menus for decades in regular restaurants uh, and gastro pubs, but it was never very popular. Patagonian toothfish? Nah, I'll have a steak or a burger or, or the fried chicken. If I show you the picture of the Patagonian toothfish, which is sustainable, healthy, nutritious, it's still ugly, and you're not going to buy it, I don't think. As soon as you change the name to Chilean sea bass, suddenly, in English, that sounds so much more desirable, and sales of this fish in the bars, in the restaurants, in the UK, in North America, in Australia, increased by 1,200% simply through a change in the name. So what started at the high end with the smoked salmon ice cream, I think does have implications for the mainstream. Um, in this case, if you're going home tonight and you're cooking, and you said, well, that professor said name is important. I call the food that I give to my kids and my family. Don't, you, I can't guarantee that you'll get a 1,200% lift, but I think there's a lot of room to play there in terms of naming. And one thing that maybe many parents think about is um, getting their children to eat their vegetables. How do we do it? They don't want to eat their greens. Well, again, naming can help. And this study from last year from the uh, Journal of the American American Medical Association, looked in a canteen in Stanford, I believe it was, at vegetable consumption among and staff, and just looked at what naming did. So we have vegetables, we can call them beets, corn, green beans, sweet potato, or we can call them lighter choice, good for you, reduced sodium, light and low, no added sugar, healthy description of those foods, or positive, like health, vitamin-rich corn, antioxidant-rich butternut squash. Or we can apply some of the naming techniques from the high end of the sensory descriptive labels, the dynamite chili and tangy lime-seasoned beets, the sweet sizzling green beans and crispy shallots. Use that sensory descriptive language instead, and in the canteen, sales of vegetables increase significantly using that descriptive language rather than the, you should be eating this, this is good for you, or just this is what it is, uh, descriptions. The three examples, I think, of where uh, the power of naming, perhaps discovered at the very high end, uh, does carry through to uh, the mainstream. And that's great, and a lot of the work that we do is around the, then the naming of foods, the description of foods, how to add value, or bias choice. Um, doesn't always work, though. In the UK last year, uh, some of the supermarkets came out with the idea of selling cauliflower steaks. Cauliflower, sort of a baked, very popular in restaurants. So if we slice it and call it steak, that has all the good connotations of expensive, rich. Um, but they were forced to withdraw this product very soon after launch. The consumers weren't having the wool pulled over their eyes. Cauliflower steak, and you charge me three euros for it? Uh, no way, and there was consumer revolt. So there are things you can do with naming, but there are also limits beyond which you can't uh, necessarily uh, pass. Uh, but it's all about um, uh, the expectation. That expectation from naming, but our focus is on expectation from the senses instead. Um, and I'm just gonna show you this video, which is slightly jittery because of the, um, of the technology, but uh, see if it works, which is from the future of storytelling from 2016 uh, about the new approach. <laughs> Thank you. 
When I arrived at Oxford University back in 1988, psychologists were studying sight in one lab and hearing in another. And I thought to myself, well, that doesn't make much sense, does it? Historically, neuroscience and psychology has always explored the senses separately. The reality is you cannot consider vision without also considering hearing, tasting without also thinking about smelling. All the senses are intimately connected. Multisensory perception turns out to be the norm and not the exception. So this new cross-modal way of thinking, this sense exploration, is leading to much richer multisensory memories and experiences. And beyond that, we have a whole generation of young people who are interested in this almost synesthetic connections between their senses and the surprises that that might bring. Today, more and more brands are investigating sense exploration and they're taking their notes straight out of the neuroscience textbook. In science, the principles we live by are to be aware of sensory dominance, to maximize the super additive and to minimize the sub additive or incongruent. Scientists and designers need to be aware of sensory dominance. Let's take an example of hearing and vision. Watch this video. What sound do you think you're hearing? Bar. Whenever you look to the left, your brain will tell you you're hearing bar. But whenever you look to the right, you'll suddenly start hearing da instead. Of course, the sound is always the same. It's always kind of a muffled bar sound, but your brain is integrating what it sees and what it hears and being dominated by those lip movements on the screen. Bar. Normally, we think we can differentiate what we see from what we hear. But in fact, very often, those senses are intimately intertwined. I've found that one of the best places to study multisensory interaction is food. Diners and restaurateurs are always surprised to learn that higher pitched music will bring out the sweetness in a dish whereas playing lower pitch, more brassy sounds will accentuate the bitter notes instead. We're in a constant state of evaluating signals and avoiding noise. However, if two of the senses are activated at the same time, then the brain confirms it's worth paying attention to. This is what we were playing with, with the sound of the sea experiment, when people are tasting the seafood and their experience is enhanced by the sounds of the sea playing in the background. In the world of sonic seasoning, sound really is the forgotten flavor sense. As sensory alchemists, we really need to think about the balance between the senses, because when that's not right, it can really ruin the experience. Another everyday example of subadditivity is when we're watching a movie and the voice that we hear has been badly dubbed. I can't help you. Go, leave me. It's no use. No matter how hard you try, it's a distracting and unpleasant experience. Another example of subadditivity, but this time one that's been used deliberately, is when the marketeers have decided to change the colour of a drink, say something like a raspberry flavoured drink. They make it blue. Raspberries aren't blue, so it's incongruent. It may be subadditive, but nevertheless, it captures our attention. That blue just stands out in amongst everything else. We're all hungry for synesthetic connections. After all, the total work of art is to be in a space where all of your senses are stimulated simultaneously. A sense exploration arms us with capabilities to enhance our experience. What new connections will we discover? So it's got a few of the examples there. Um that I'll talk about, the sound of the sea seafood dish using technology and atmospheric sounds to change taste, the way in which sometimes incongruency is powerful cue to capture consumer uh, attention. Uh, and that all starts, I think, with our dominant sense with uh, vision, with the eye, because that is what sets the expectation, perhaps before or more strongly than anything else. So a lot of our work is about trying to understand what is the expectation. When you see something like this, your brain, in the blink of an eye, has made a prediction. Is it savory or sweet? Uh, we've got different colors, color contrast. We've got the texture on the bottle. Is that congruent or not? 
and we're trying to find in our research the colors that set the best expectations uh, in consumers. And in particular, very often, the best expectations of taste and of sweetness. So we'd like to deliver sweetness by eye and perhaps reduce the actual sugar content. So a lot of our experiments don't involve tasting at all. They just look, look at tastes, look at tasty things, and say, is that sweet or sour? Sweet, got to be sweet. And this is just the sort of question we were asking 50,000 people at the Science Museum in London over the last two years as part of a Cravings exhibition where we showed people six drinks and asked them that question. There's no literally correct answer because you cannot, colors do not have tastes nor tastes colors. And yet there's an intuition, a feeling, and that most people uh, predict this as being the sweetest looking drink. Second choice quite often comes up as the blue, kind of surprising color there. Uh, and with 50,000 people, we can show that these associations, expectations of taste to what continent our participants came from, Africa, Asia, Europe, Oceania, South America, red was that sweetest drink for them all. And hence, if we're launching a drink that we want consumers to taste sweet, but reduce the sugar, this might be uh, the one to go for. Blue being kind of the other sort of interesting one, why is that the second sweetest color? Because marketeers and uh, sociologists were saying 20, 30 years ago that you uh, couldn't sell a blue product. Blue was unnatural, it was chemical, it was artificial, um, and it would never work. Um, and I think that story is changing in interesting ways. Uh, here you see some of the drinks we show, where now we vary not just the color of the liquid, but the receptacle in which it is presented. Same blue color, but we might find that when we show that drink in a uh, cocktail glass, people think of blue curacao, orange but blue association. When we show that blue drink in a plastic bathroom cup, maybe you're thinking mint and Listerine. Same color, but different associations based uh, on the shape of the glass. And these are the sorts of drinks that we are now showing in seven countries simultaneously over the internet to try and say, if we were selling a blue drink in China, what would be the best receptacle in which to display it in an advert? So which would the Chinese participants say they were willing to pay most uh, uh, for. Um, so we can assess these associations, expectations across the world. Those associations are changing by time. Blue was an impossible color. It's now becoming a more popular one. And I think the reason is the Instagram generation that now 30 to 40% of diners and drinkers can't help but take a picture of the food and drinks that they are served and share them on social media before they even taste the food. And as such, chefs, restaurateurs, cocktail makers are starting to have to play much more to the eye to create something that their customers want to share. A bowl of tomato soup in a white bowl, no one wants to take a picture of that, but make a rainbow drink and suddenly that is Instagram worthy. It might not taste great, but it is Instagram worthy, and that is dictating some of the success and movement in the marketplace, I think, as now we see so many uh, blue magic, uh, uh, pea flower blues being brought into the marketplace and being uploaded on Instagram so much. And what's noticeable about the recent increase in blue drinks and foods is how they always stress the natural source of that blue color. In the past, blue was artificial chemical, so if you see it today, it's got to be a natural blue from pea flower uh, or from the blue magic. Um, and that is something that is true on the Instagram, but also 
dictating some wine sales in Italy. I think the sparkling um, wine uh, in uh, Barcelona, I think this was launched. Uh, GIF, we have Blue Monde as well. Uh, wines that are blue, white wines that are colored uh, blue. <sighs> Not because it, I don't know, what do you expect that to taste of? Uh, maybe here, this color stands out on the shelf. So it's used for marketing purposes uh, and may or may not succeed depending on what the consumer expects that is going to taste like. And a lot of our work with companies, with gin companies, with vodka companies who are launching blue gin or pink colored vodka, they're doing it to capture the attention of the shopper and they say, but people say it tastes wrong. But we, we, we take regular gin that's very clear London gin, we color it pink, we just add coloring, and then consumers say it doesn't taste right, it tastes funny, it tastes off, because that pink color in the drink is setting those red fruit expectations, and if they are not met, um, one has a, a problem. And this, of course, in a way, is the first reference back to the futurists, to F.T. Marinetti. I'm not sure the contemporary marketeers of blue wine Remember that uh, Marinetti was serving blue wine in his meals in the 1930s uh, here in Italy. His aim was to discombobulate uh, the drinkers. What is this? Blue wine? It's all wrong. Uh, but today, the marketeers are doing it with a slightly different purpose and may or may not be successful depending on how they manage those uh, expectations. Expectations that are, are there, I think, in pretty much every, every food we see in the supermarket has a particular color. These um, uh, little bowls of sweeties here, lots of different colors, and our brain, I think, is making predictions about the flavor of each one. Through to probably the oldest use of coloring, kind of the, the, the skins of the grapes used to color red wines for thousands of years. This isn't just a contemporary phenomenon. It's a historic one, and in the world of wine, it turns out that the more expert you are, the easier it is to fool people by a change in color. We were just um, in Barcelona with 200 sommeliers um, and, uh, and restaurateurs, giving them white wine, rosé wine, and white wine colored rosé, asking them to describe the aromas of each wine from nose to tasting. And there, the more experienced the sommelier, the more red wine aromas they got from the white wine glass when it was colored pink. Social drinkers are a bit less influenced. They don't really know what a wine tastes like. The expert on seeing what looks like a red wine, their brain is predicting Oh, I can tell this was uh, how old this wine was. I can tell that the summer was hot, that the grapes have been over-extracted. The expert can read so much into the color, their expectations are stronger, and hence those expectations anchor and change the experience uh, far more uh, than for uh, the social one. Uh, we do have some wine for you today, but not for this stage. It's for a little bit later on. Um, but the best way to sort of show the power of changing color on what we think we taste is by analogy with the McGurk effect. We just saw. Uh, if you look at the face on the left and think what you hear uh, going in your ears, uh, you should hear ba. Now look here uh, and think what you hear going in your ears. Uh, La. Whenever you look to the left, you hear bar. Whenever you look to the right, you hear in your ears something different. If you close your eyes, you can tell the real sound is a bar. But open your eyes again, look to the right, and you cannot hear, but hear da. So I've been watching this video since 1998, 
when it appeared in the National Portrait Gallery in London. 20, 20 years later, my brain is still tricked. I still hear one thing looking to the left. I hear something else looking to the right. I know I'm being fooled in some way, but I cannot keep my senses separate. I think I hear things with my ears, and I see things with my eyes, but this example, as with the colored wine example shows, our brain combines the senses before it gives us or your consumer access to the experience. And hence what we think we are hearing, we may be seeing. What we think we are seeing, we may be smelling. What we think we're smelling can influence what we touch. And that is the world of multisensory that is um, so exciting these days. And if we put here two products in a side-by-side -side test, then um, your consumers might say, yes, th these two things sound different. Which one do you prefer? Oh, I like the one on the right. Why do you like this product on the right? Oh, because it sounds, you know, I, I like that da sound. Your consumers may be as honest as they can be in reporting the differences and their preferences, but that does not mean, as in this case, that it gives you an accurate indicator of what's really underlying uh, the uh, experience. Okay. Um, so I think this sensory dominance is very powerful, and those expectations we have set by name, but by eye, uh, can be used to capture our attention or to confound us, to perhaps make things taste sweeter. Or in the hands of this chef, this is Joseph Youssef from Kitchen Theory in London, who we work a lot with, one of that new generation of chefs uh, who's in the mind and the stuff that people are not taught in cookery school. And this is part of his uh, synesthesia menu two or three years ago. And when he heard about the power of color, he created this amuse-bouche called the Four Tastes using spherification. Uh, so you have these very colorful balls of flavor, but they're spherified, so they have no smell, and you won't know what they actually taste like until you put them in the mouth and they explode. Uh, this is what they look like when served to diners in the restaurant, in Kitchen Theory. The waitress will bring these four spoons out and put them randomly in front of each and every of the 10 diners. And she says, this is the four tastes. Uh, the chef recommends you start with the salty spoon, then have the bitter spoon, then the sour spoon, and end on a sweet note. And she walks off, and the diners, but, but you didn't tell me which, which spoon is which. And that is the point of the dish, that diners at the table need to rearrange their spoons in the order salty on the left-hand side, then bitter, then sour, and the sweet spoon on the right. The waitress can then note down the diner's responses, and that can feed into published data that we have published on associations. In this case, this is the consensual response. 75% of people think white and salty go together, browny black and bitter, green and sour, and the pinkish red of the ice cream as sweet. And at the dining some people get this, 75% of people get this uh, as you see it here. Some do not, and that creates a discussion. Why did you think white was salty? I thought it was sweet because of sugar. Well, salt is also white, uh, and it creates a discussion, and diners hopefully realize how important color is to their expectations and thereafter to their experience. And here are just the results from the restaurant or from online, showing the majority of people choosing the um, uh, uh, sour and green combination, the majority black and bitter. So again, all of this based on research, but used by the chef in a kind of an in innovative way to engage diners in some sort of storytelling, theater, and interactivity at uh, table. And what starts there now is going on and out, um, because it's not just the color of the food or drink that matters, though that is very important. It turns out color anywhere 
matters to what we think we taste. So with uh, Fabiana Carvalho in Sao Paulo in Brazil, a professional coffee roaster and grader, we've been testing at the um, South American and now global coffee conferences. And our current or recent experiment was like this, serving speciality coffee from one of four cups and getting people to rate uh, the taste, the aroma of the coffee. And even though we're asking only expert roasters, graders, um, and tasters, nevertheless, the same coffee tastes different in those different glasses. That the yellow or the green glass set expectations of sourness. The pink glass, the pink cup looks like it's going to be a bit sweeter. It's bizarre, you can't taste the cup, but your brain sees that and automatically sets those expectations that anchor the taste and bring something out in what you are tasting. And this is an exciting area for us. This hasn't been quite published yet, but for us we see a great market in taking all the research about wine glasses and applying it to the world of coffee, an area where coffee, speciality coffee, may have more volatiles, is in some sense more complex than wine, and yet we can find no research, no science on the design of a coffee cup. Bizarre, given how much coffee or of tea is sold, and that we see an opportunity at the moment, and there are companies out there who are working in this space to deliver um, uh, uh, cups that do enhance the experience and are proved to do so, and hence might be worth um, paying for. And that color of the drink or of the cup also extends to the color of the can. Um, and, what, and in our research, what we're often doing is picking up on what marketeers intuitively stumbled across decades ago. So this, um, from Louis Cheskin, one of my sort of favorites of, of sort of, I guess, the 50s, 60s, uh, Madison Avenue's marketing magician, so-called, um, who brought people into the uh, Madison Avenue office and gave them seven up, uh, changed the color of the can, and when he added some yellow to the color of the can, consumers said it tasted more lemony and limey. The composition of the product has not changed, only the color of the can. It makes no sense, except in terms of the psychology. If you're drinking from the can, all you see is the can. And that sets the expectations automatically, um, as uh, Coca-Cola found to their cost in 2011, I think it was, when they came out with a Christmas can, white for Christmas and polar bears and world wildlife, all good things. And yet, what did the consumers complain about? The, co the Coke tastes different. Same Coke, same chemical formulation, but when you see a white can, you have different expectations. They were forced to withdraw the product and then give these cans away, airplanes, for passengers who can't complain. Um, but the power of color is there, and I think now we can bring the science to the table, optimize the color design, in order to accentuate something deliberately and strategically. Um, and this is just one example of that from work we did at the Edinburgh Science Festival. A brewer who works there, and every year we have hundreds of people. We give them a glass or a bottle or a can of beer, and we do an experiment on the transparency of beer, on beer in cans versus bottles. Does it taste the same? And this year, uh, on the color of the label. So we had people drinking uh, a batch of beer, either from a bottle with this label or with this label, and our prediction that those yellowy green colors should accentuate the citrus notes uh, that are very popular in beers in the UK to this day. Uh, and that is, in fact, uh, what the results uh, showed that we could bring out um, citrus notes with the color, with some description and words too, but at the, sort of the border of design um, and sort of measurement science. And so here, doing things strategically and deliberately, designing labels to accentuate preferred uh, notes. 
that is where uh, we are uh, uh, today. Probably the last thing to, 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 to mention here on, on the color, uh, I probably have the honor of being the, psych the, the researcher who's done more research on crisp packets than anyone else in the world. I never intended to do that, but uh, th these are the sort of things that are, are very interesting to me. Color, the feel, the weight, the texture, the sound. And going to the supermarket and looking at the trends and the correlations that consumers' brains may pick up on. So we went to a British supermarket uh, in the crisp aisle, potato chips. You find that green is used for cheddar and onion, mature cheddar cheese, uh, cheesy onion, cheese and onion. Green is cheese and onion. That is the convention in the British marketplace. Salt and vinegar, by contrast, is blue. McCoys, kettles, twirls, hula hoops. 20 brands of potato chip all use blue salt and vinegar, green cheese and onion convention. Kind of arbitrary, but consumers learn that. And when they're wandering down the aisle, they pick things up by color, often without reading the small print. So our visual search and selection is based on color. And hence, uh, you come to this, walkers. If you saw those crisp packets, what did we just learn? We said cheese and onion is, uh, is green, uh, and blue is salt and vinegar. So that's the way it should be if walkers followed the convention. But in fact, it's the other way around. Walkers go against the conventions of the marketplace. Um, they have done so since 1983. This ought to be incongruent. This should not work. You should follow the convention but maybe if you're a big enough player and you have a cheeky enough marketing campaign, you can get away. And I think the story here was in 1983 when they introduced cheese and onion flavor crisps. They wanted to get the customer to try the new flavor. So they switched the colors, knowing that consumers would just pick up a bag of their favorite color crisp, get them home and think, damn, the wrong flavor. And yet you've got them tasting new flavor in the home environment. A risky strategy, but one that has worked and continues to work. And maybe you think of the blue wine trying to play in that space, uh, but maybe will not be as successful as walkers. So a really interesting case study for us. When does incongruency work? And when does it fail in the marketplace? What are the key factors? Um, we know in a high-end restaurant, surprising, incongruent things work. But in the supermarket, maybe we want to follow kind of convention uh, most of the time. Uh, so if color is so important and the meaning of color varies by brand, then if we are a crisp manufacturer or a biscuit manufacturer or a chewing gum manufacturer or any kind of food or beverage manufacturer, we may want to sell our product in a foreign market, uh, and we might want to know what the optimal color is that is congruent or not with the crisp. So this is where a lot of our recent research is done um, for our internal purposes only, where we create new crisp varieties. The Crispies brand doesn't exist, uh, and we l make eight different flavors of these new crisps, uh, and then launch them on the internet in multiple countries, China, uh, South America, and the UK in this case, and get consumers around the world in very quick and very cheap research to pick their preferred color for tomato. I guess that's kind of an easy one. Tomato should be red, I suppose. Maybe not much doubt about that. Cheese and onion? Well, that could vary by country or group. Um, and here are the sort of results we get from this massive online data collection. Very quick, very cheap. Um, with consumers, we can see that a blue crisp packet means natural in uh, Colombia. Uh, in China, we're thinking cheese and bacon. Uh, and in the UK, we've got lots of those Walkers fans, cheese and onion. So the same color in the same packaging for the same product has different connotations in the different countries. And hence, we can identify potential dangers or opportunities or, or, or ways of combining color that will hopefully work 
in multiple marketplaces, and I'll show a bit later uh, how we can do that. So we've, we've got our color scheme, maybe for a, a, an international product that has the same meaning, appropriate meaning. Then what we do is start creating virtual shelves, virtual displays of those crispies crisps, and have our subjects trying to search for a particular flavor. So you're told at the start of the trial, you're looking for a packet of chicken crisps. Are there any in this display here uh, or not? And then we can measure the speed with which people can find the target crisp packet and see whether it's easier you, as a consumer, you're quicker to find what you want if the color is congruent in your mind or in your nation with uh, the meaning, which is what we find here. Adding to the importance of picking up the most appropriate color of packaging and then incorporating it in the design in order to um, help consumers find what they're looking for, but also then to arrange your displays in the best way. So here we've got three displays of um, was it washing up liquid, looks like. We've got here the same products on each of the three shelves, but one of those shelf displays works better. Consumers find what they want faster, they like it more, and I think they're willing to pay extra for it too. It's a bit hard to say which, which, which uh, shelf display, they all look more or less the same. And yet, we find that the shelf display on the left is better for the consumer and for the product. Why so? Because it's obeying a correspondence between dark colors and low, and the lighter packaging presentation and high. And this is one of those correspondences with color, um, dark and low and heavy uh, and low pitch, light and high and sweet. These are the correspondences, and if you incorporate them in an online display, be it for um, this product or for popcorn or potato chips, again, the display on the left is preferred over the right. Many people do not have the opportunity to control their shelf display, but some who do fail to optimize, I think, the layout, given these kind of correspondences uh, in uh, mind. Okay, so this is all the visual aspects of uh, packaging. And to us, a lot of the work that we do with companies around the world is trying to convince people how important packaging is to product perception. And to argue against this advert from Ben & Jerry's ice cream, 99% pleasure. The rest is the packaging, 1%. We would argue that probably more than half of the pleasure or the experience of the product comes from the packaging. And if that's true, it makes it bizarre that so many companies do product formulation, product testing in one factory, and packaging is designed somewhere else, and product and pack meet for the first time on the shelf in the supermarket. That kind of has to be wrong uh, to us and much of our research is trying to prove to food and drinks companies why they need to think more about uh, um, and why they need to think more about the image molds, these arbitrary forms that are associated with a product or a category of product, um, but which change the experience. The classic example is, I think, maybe one of the most powerful image molds is the cork-stoppered wine bottle. And if I serve you exactly the same wine in a screw cap, in a bag, in a box, it does not taste the same. You do not enjoy it as much. Uh, in a blind taste test, you can't tell the difference. But as soon as you know the packaging, it's a completely different experience. So this is perhaps the best example of uh, the power of packaging to change um, the experience, but it, what's true for wine, I think, extends across categories. For soup, we have the traditional can format, and as soon as the Covent Garden Soup Company 
started packaging their soup in the Tetra Pak in Britain. That format is associated with fresh milk, and suddenly the soup seems fresher. It's the same soup, but the packaging, and, and time and again we find that consumers cannot separate product from pack. What you think about the packaging carries over to what you say about the contents. These, you just cannot keep them separate in uh, your mind. And hence one thinks, how can we optimize the, um, the image mold for the category? Which I suppose brings us to what some people are doing now in cases like this of the olive oil sold in the perfume mold. I'm not quite sure if this one works or not, really. Uh, it's sort of clear what is being done, uh, that this perfume is very expensive. It comes into these small bottles. Uh, but do I really want to drink perfume? Hmm, I'm not sure about quite how, how the consumer perception will go, but it's clear that they're tra taking the mold from one category uh, to um, another. And uh, hmm, yes, a nice classic. That is. So all this on, 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 on packaging um, and image mold then is uh, an area that's suddenly exploding, I think, amongst researchers coming out in our new book, uh, Multisensory Packaging, um, Designing New Product Experiences, out next month, uh, where we have 10, 12 different research groups who are all starting to apply neuroscience and sensory science to packaging for the first time, I think, and are starting to come out with some very interesting ideas uh, and approaches to the design of, of all aspects, the feel, the sight, the sound, even the smell or taste of packaging. Uh, and incorporating ideas from one category into uh, another. Um, and quite often here, uh, as was mentioned in the video, there's the idea of sort of synesthetic design. Um, synesthetic marketing is sort of a powerful, uh, if perhaps misleading uh, notion. What is synesthetic marketing? It's things like these potato chip bags from uh, Walker's Sensations in the UK. Seven varieties, seven flavors of premium uh, uh, crisps. And we see that the chicken and thyme flavor is illustrated by a greenish yellow swirl. And it has a, a trumpet or a trombone at the top. Whereas the balsamic vinegar crisps have a purple swirl and a violin. So here we have the packaging designers trying to convey something about the senses, a taste, musical instrument. This is kind of synesthetic design. In this case, we did the research to show that the designers got the instruments and the colors wrong. When we give people the seven varieties of potato chips blind and ask them, what instrument are you thinking of when you taste roast chicken? Uh, it was not the trumpet, it was something else. People were consistent, but they were different from what the designers had done. Same for the color. And in fact, walkers then changed their sensations packaging design, whether based on our research, or certainly after our research was published. Um, and so this, and this notion then of this aesthetic design, engaging senses that you cannot directly stimulate by playing on these connections is uh, powerful, potentially exciting, and can be researched systematically, as you find in um, Michael Haverkamp's book, Synesthetic Design. He's focusing more on car design, but I think there are a number of insights there also for, um, for the packaging design and for food design. And picking up, in a way, on what Italian has been talking about for decades, in fact, this just, uh, forget the name of the book from Belly, uh, a nice example of sort of synesthetic design uh, questionnaire, which I use quite often. You ask people, which one is the very soft wool? Which colors, which shapes, which presentations convey that notion? It's kind of synesthetic. Which is the diet food? Is it the one with the waves, the triangles? Um, which of those washing powders is the deep cleaning one? No words, no description, just color and form, but maybe can pick up on conventions in the marketplace, such as the fresh daily milk, then I guess it has to be the blue and white one, not one of the others. So 20 years ago, people were thinking in this space, 
but doing it more intuitively. And what we're starting to bring to the table is a science of these almost synesthetic uh, correspondences. Uh, and a science that's built on uh, experimentation, and a science that's built on uh, of, of psychology, of sound, symbolism, uh, and was first captured, I think, in 1929 by shapes like these. These are the famous uh, Buba and Kiki. Two words that mean nothing in any language, Buba and Kiki. And we've got two shapes on the top. And the kind of experiment that's been run for almost a century now is to say, which name would you give to which shape? Which is the booba? Like that? Like this? No. It's got to be like that. So 98% of people around the world feel that that's the right mapping. There's no literally right question, but it just sort of feels right somehow. Is it the shape of the letters matching the shape of the shape? Well, then why is round speech sounds indicated by round letters anyway, and, and angular speech sounds by angular letters. And we've been to the Himba tribe of Coco land in Namibia, no written language, no schools, no supermarkets, and they say exactly the same thing as you. Booba has to be the round one. So it can't be about the written form. Okay, so this is old research, and what we think have, have brought to the table is the sound symbolism and applying it to food which is what I'm going to get you to do uh, now. I think we should start eating something. So, uh, we've got some um, chocolate. We're gonna be, you're each going to get three pieces of chocolate to try. Um, and I want you to think about uh, the shape, where you would put a point on the top scale here to match the taste of the chocolate. So you'll notice each tray has a different colored uh, sticker. So uh, there are three chocolates for you to try. Yes, yes. Okay. So here we go. Take that one. That's good. So you've got the orange chocolate, the yellow chocolate, and the pink plate of chocolate. You've got two there, so please try a little piece. I got to try one and pass it around. I got to try a little of the yellow, and you at the back there. How about some a piece of pink? So again, yes. So take a piece of chocolate from your plate, um, and then think if you had to indicate what that chocolate is, the experience without words is the chocolate on your plate more booba or more kiki. Makes no sense, it's silly, but this is what we do with you know, 10 Nestle marketing executives um, and we get kind of a consistent results. So make a mental mark. So you here have got uh, orange chocolate. Make your mental mark on that scale, okay. More booba or more kiki. Uh, no, I said there were three. You got orange already. You haven't had yellow. Have you had orange? Okay, pass it down. Okay, and you've had pink. So if you want to try. So these three plates of chocolate are slightly different chocolates. So it's a bit of sort of fine sensory taste test. Should I take that one? Yellow. And have you had yellow? Okay. Have you had pink? The pink one? Pink. Okay. You've had two? You've had pink, yellow. yellow. So you need pink. Sorry. Do we have a pink plate anywhere? Pink? There's pink. Orange. Yellow. Yellow. Pink. Can I take a pink? Swap you for a yellow. Okay, number three. Okay. Oh. 
So you had all three? You've had some very bitter chocolate. Anyone? Which one? You bet. Only orange. So you want yellow? Is that yellow one? I'll take that one. Yellow. And pink. Oh, was that pink one? You had pink? Yeah. Got that. Okay, and the pink. So, uh, we had three varieties of dark chocolate from Nobby. We had a 70% cacao, an 88% cacao, and an astronomical 90 cacao. So these three chocolates are quite similar. They're all dark chocolates, and all that varies is the bitterness of the chocolate. Uh, and what we find is that for milk chocolates, most people say milk chocolate is booba, and dark chocolate is kiki. I don't know why it just feels right. Something about the bitterness is angular. Sweetness of a milk chocolate is booba. And hence, in this case, what you should probably have got is I think the yellow one was a 70%. And it's something like that. The pink one was the 88%. Um, and the orange one, I think, was the bitterest 99%. So you'll get something like this. The points might move a bit along the scale. I don't care about that, only the relative position, which says to us, at least, that and we, we published in 2009 with Alberto Galacci from Milan, um, that tastes have shapes as well as colors. Now, the color of taste makes sense because I can see things that are red, orange, yellow, and green. But where does the shape of taste come from, and how might we use it? Do this with um, shapes or with words. I can make up random words like tuki and lula, maluma and tikiti, and ask you to put your experience of chocolate or beer or anything else on these scales. It sounds silly, but people are very consistent in matching sweet with round, bitter with angular. And if I give people a um, a, uh, how does it go? A, 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 a milk chocolate truffle. Um, a sumptuously smooth truffle encased in milk chocolate. This was the name on the side of the packet of chocolate. It no longer exists. And I asked people, okay, tell me, is this chocolate you're tasting? Uh, is it more lula or cocoa? Is it maluma or tikiti? Because it's milk and truffly and melts in your mouth. You want to call that a maluma. It's a lula, it's a round shape. Uh, it's definitely not a cocoa. So this was kind of problematic because the product that people were tasting was in fact called cocoa chocolate. So you have a name for a product that does not match at all the shape or the sound symbolism of the name. And when we published this in 2011, I think we predicted this is a product that should fail because the name does not convey the taste experience uh, that uh, follows, and it has since been uh, withdrawn. Um, others, I think, get it better, uh, and I'm really interested in sort of the history of the naming of confectionery of chocolates. Because um, I really sort of think if you went to Mars and you just told people, I've got a chocolate called Aero, or Munchies, Crunchies, Kit Kats, from the sound, the speech sounds convey which of those chocolate products have a biscuity center. You've got a ksh, ksh in the name. The munchy has biscuit center. The crunchy has a, a, a honeycomb center. The Kit Kat has a biscuity center compared to the, the bubbly and the aero and the rollo. These are really rounded names that we think are, are match um, caramelly, soft milk chocolate. And so many of these brands have been around for 80 or 100 years now. So they are some of the most successful chocolate brands out there. Is it because of their name matched the taste? Did the marketeers in Nestle in the 1930s know about the names of taste? 
or is this just survival of the fittest in the marketplace? You launch hundreds of chocolate brands, those with a good name survive, sort of Darwinian evolution, and those with a bad name, like Coco, disappear, never to be seen uh, again. Um, and if we know, then I think, about the names and the shapes of taste, we can then start designing chocolate products to convey an expectation of sweetness and hopefully reduce the sugar content. An experiment we wanted to do in the marketplace, but no company is going to let us change the shape of their chocolate, launch it in different countries, and see what happens. Um, but the experiment has been kind of done for us uh, when Cadbury Dairy Milk, taken over by the North Americans, changed the shape of the chocolate. The iconic chocolate bar for decades has been this rectangular brick. Uh, when Mondelez came along, they changed the shape, to rounded the pieces, kept the front pane the same size, but cut off 3.9 grams. And what happens? Consumers complain. You've changed our product, but what do consumers write in and complain about? They say the product is more sugary, this one. And then Mondelez International come back and say, we have not changed the formulation at all. All we did was change the shape. But we were in print three years before this happened, saying if sweet is round and you want to set an expectation of sweetness, make your chocolate rounder and you can reduce the sugar. Sugar is so cheap that no one's going to do that. But here we find in the marketplace, people were complaining about what we said they would. Make it rounder, it tastes uh, sweeter. And if you look carefully now and keep a tab on the modification of popular confections, I think we can see other companies who are also rounding off their roses. The, the, the story in the newspapers, in the, in the publicity, isn't about sugar or sugar reduction. But if you know the shape of taste, you can sort of see a reason why people might be moving towards rounder shapes in order to convey the almost synesthetically uh, the shape of uh, sweet. Or at the opposite extreme, um, if sweet is round and bitter, the high cacao dark is angular, well, coffee is also angular. So if I'm trying to communicate with my consumer the taste properties of my coffee, maybe putting an angular star, as Costa coffee does, is actually communicating more than we realize. I see that shape, and immediately, automatically, the customer's brain is expecting a slightly more bitter coffee taste than if we put a round booba on top. And this is an experiment we have been doing and published in Australia. And if it's not the, um, the shape of, of, of the, of the um, top of the coffee, maybe I want to use these insights in logo and label design. Think of the Capriccio chain. What has it got? An angular red star on the cup. Why is it there? What is it doing? Or I think Colombian brand uh, Vereda Central is using, again, an angular star here cleverly placed at the bottom of the cup. Why is it there? I think it's sort of intuitively communicating taste properties, and by so doing, may uh, uh, lead to more success uh, in the market. And here, the, how the chef, Joseph Youssef, took these ideas about tastes having shapes. And he created the booba kiki dish as part of his synesthesia menu. He had to find, it took him a long time to find somebody to slice plates in two. No one would do it for him, but eventually he got uh, a plate slicer. And this is laid down. One waiter comes with one side of the plate. Another waiter puts down the other side of the plate. And the diners are encouraged to try and think which is the booba side, which is the kiki side. Clearly, the angular shapes here, more kiki. The round dots, more booba. And then for the chef, the challenge is what flavors, what textures, and what tastes are really angular or really round. So we have um, rhubarb and tart apple. Uh, sort of a ceviche on this side with lemon juice, all angular tastes and flavors. And on this side, uh, we have uh, uh, sort of a gnocchi-like um, 
potato and other very rounded flavors instead. And hopefully the diners come away from this dish thinking about the taste of shape. And yes, I never thought about it, but bananas, they have to be round. They are booba, not kiki. Lemons are kiki. Uh, and there's a whole world of tasting shapes. We don't know where it comes from, but we know it exists. And you can incorporate it in dish design or in uh, um, uh, packaging design. Um, and have been doing, I suppose, for the awful longest time. I think the San Pellegrino star has been there since the 1890s. I think the earliest we, we could reference we could find to it. And, and, and no one says what it's doing there. And it's not just that there's one angular star. There's one on the front, two here, another one on the cap, and often three red stars on the label on the back of the bottle. Seven red stars on the bottle, and no one said why. But if, if you find that still water is booba and sparkling water is kiki, this is communicating taste properties without language. And this is at the center. You can't miss the red star. It's this almost synesthetic communication. It's not there on the aquapana on the still water from uh, San Pellegrino brand, but it is there here and in others. Saskia Classic, uh, Apollinaris. Again, angular and often redness used to communicate carbonation and, I think, uh, 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 bitterness. But, uh, all got the stars and the beers and the lagers are carbonated. So that's angular. They're bitter tasting, so that's also angular. And you sort of see it. Estrella, Mahu, Red Stripe, uh, Heineken, Bass & Co., the first trademarked label, angular and red communicating with consumers about uh, the taste experience uh, to come. Done intuitively, done by survival of the fittest here, a uh, Colombian uh, beer brand with a star. And again, when I spoke to them, they had no idea why they had a star on their label. Maybe there was an ast astrologer upstairs or something, or you know, it's another, no idea. But, but I think there's a reason behind it, and if you know it, you can design products, packaging labels more effectively to communicate the taste the Sapporo star being another example. The um, Estrella brand, again, bringing to center stage that star, communicating non-verbally, almost synesthetically, uh, the tasting experience to be had through to the Heineken uh, ads that ran in the States. It's not a Nike ad. Huh? And then a few days later, uh, and then the reveal that this star is a symbol of this, that, and the other. In, the, in this case, the Heineken, I think, the star was to indicate that they won a beer prize in 1820. It, but it kind of stuck. So the historical reasons for angularity may have different causes, but I think if the shape of the logo, the label, and or the typeface communicate the taste, then you're in a, in a, in a better position. Uh, that the consumer will experience your product as more congruent and hence as more fluent, uh, and that will lead to a, an easier and hence probably more enjoyable uh, experience. And that leaves us just with that then on um, our work, taking those ideas of color and the expectations they set and of shape and the expectations they set and just designing prototype water bottles and trying to see which combination of color and form best communicate carbonation or stillness. Um, but doing it in a bottom-up way uh, and based on the existing uh, science. Um, and probably the last thing here on the, on, the, on the visuals of the packaging, not just the shapes, that sort of brings us onto, onto the typeface too. Um, and in work we've been doing with typeface designers, typeface can be angular or it can be rounded. You know, and every package has lots of, uh, uh, of text, lots of type on the always in a particular typeface. But why is that typeface used and what impact does it have? And again, you look in the literature and in the last, there are only probably 20 published studies of the psychology of typeface. And yet everything we read is conveyed by a typeface, a typeface that has angularity or roundness. So in the Science Museum in London, 
we've been giving people uh, jelly beans from a bowl with a sign that says, eat me. And other people in the museum get to eat jelly beans with a sign that says, eat me. But it's angular. And then we ask people, how sweet or sour is the jelly bean that you have just eaten? And those who saw this sign rate the sourness of the jelly bean as whereas this rounded sweetness again that it seems to bring out uh, the sweet uh, uh, tastes. So this again is an sort of exciting area uh, uh, for us on the psychology of typeface, the psychology, the taste of typeface, uh, deconstructing existing brands, say probably the rounded Powlig coffee, not going particularly well with a bitter tasting drink, and then creating lots of different typefaces and throwing them into massive online uh, research. Uh, and here showing that the rounded typefaces do connote sweetness when alone or on a, on a cup, whereas the angular typeface, angular is bitter, angular is sour, and angular is salty. And if I want to differentiate a sour tasting thing from a bitter tasting product, then sour typeface should be asymmetrical, whereas bitter is angular and symmetrical. Um, these are all insights from the lab research, but now working with typeface designers like Sarah Hindman, who runs a typeface design agency, a designer who's really excited to work with the scientist in order to provide functional benefits to her new uh, creative uh, uh, designs. Okay. Okay. Uh, but we need to be a little cautious here. I said it's synesthesia-like, it's synesthetic marketing. That's all true, but don't start thinking we're talking about synesthesia proper. Synesthesia being what? Kandinsky, Scriabin, uh, Baudelaire, Nabokov, uh, David Hockney, and others have. These are the, indivi the rare individuals who see colored numbers or days of the week or, 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 or feel things when they're tasting something. This is the 5% of the population who have extraordinary connections. And for too long now, I think, uh, design has tried to use the sinister unusual connections to create works of art or other designs. These things that we're looking at here are synesthesia-like because it's surprising that a taste has a shape and a color. That doesn't seem to make sense. It's surprising like synesthesia, but it's different in that we all agree that sweet is round. We all think that sweet is pinkish red and that bitter is angular and dark. So that we all share the same surprising connection means to us that it's much more useful in the world of design because I can communicate with all of my customers in a way that synesthesia proper does not uh, let you. Uh... Right. So, on to the mouth, inside the mouth, and to taste. Hopefully on the table you should have some little bits of filter paper. Um, and if you can get your hands on one, I'd encourage you to take a piece in these little boats, wooden boats, uh, and to put it on your uh, tongue and let the saliva wash across it. I'm not sure if I've got the blanks. Cause we, have, we have packets of uh, uh, tasting strips and uh, packets of the tasting uh, of, of blanks. So can anyone taste anything on these? No. No. <laughs> Didn't work. Um, so I've got the wrong packet. Uh, we normally have um, the tasting strips. And when we give this filter paper that looks the same to everyone, uh, about a quarter of the population will say, just paper, can taste nothing. A half the population or so, mm, it's a bit unpleasant, it's a bit, and a quarter of the population will pull a face 
and want to spit that piece of paper out. Those are the so-called super tasters. Everyone gets the same bit of filter paper, but some people, possibly because they have more taste buds on their tongue, experience the same foods and more bitter in uh, taste. Others who have maybe less sensitivity to certain bitter compounds and or also less taste buds on their tongue, uh, have a less intense sensation to the same taste stimuli. If we look at a population, we can find that some people have as many as 14 times more taste buds on their tongue than other people. And just imagine what it would be like to have 14, more, 14 times more receptors in your eyes and ears, how much more you might hear or uh, 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 see. So I think this difference in taste world is potentially important. It is itself most clearly in bitter tasting foods. The super tasters are less likely to like Brussels sprouts. Uh, Aperol too, I suppose, will probably be not so pleasant to many a super taster. Uh, the dark chocolate, the coffee, the olives, again, all tend to be too bitter, at least initially, to uh, the super tasters. Um, and so with the chefs and with some of the food companies, we've been thinking about ways in which to deliver a dish or a product that will target the non-tasters or the super tasters. We don't know who we are in advance. Maybe by launching products, say toothpastes, uh, which contain zinc, and zinc can taste very bitter to a super taster. Maybe you have one brand of designed for the non-taster, another brand designed for the super taster, and just launch them and let the market take care themselves uh, of, um, uh, of the taste. And maybe taste is the world in which we differ most. And it sort of gives rise to a, a curious question of why we have different, our feet are different sizes, so we have different shoes. We have you know, different clothes for men and women, uh, and personalization is so big a theme these days. How come we're all happy to accept eating the same food? That sort of the packaged food just comes as it is. Where is a possibility to personalize or customize food? Do we want it or do we not? Is there something special about food? Or is it the case that perhaps we, while being born in different taste worlds, we kind of learn to accommodate to the tastes that we find, and we learn to like bitter tastes as long as they're combined with caffeine, alcohol, uh, sugar, or uh, something like that. Okay. But, of course, there is more to taste uh, than purely the taste buds on the tongue. And for me, I think probably the taste buds and the tongue are the least important or interesting bit uh, of tasting. But most of what we think we taste really, in fact, uh, comes from the nose instead. And if you want to try a, um, taking a jelly bean, but not eating it yet, and just randomly pick any color. We should take one of those for you, and some of those for you. Let's get that. Oh. Yep. Good. There we go. Come back. back. So, I'll take a couple for me. As well, as well. Good. Pass that back to them. I'll be back there. Sorry. Um, and the way to, I think, to illustrate the power of what goes beyond taste, the power of the nose, is just to sort of hold your nose closed as if you're going deep sea diving, and then to put one of these jelly beans in your mouth and start chewing, and think about what you taste in your mouth, and you probably get sweet, 
You might get a bit of sourness, but that's kind of it. It's a thin tasting experience. But when you let go of your nose, suddenly you get the volatiles coming through the back of the mouth, in, and suddenly you get the fruity notes, or the floral notes, the meaty, the herbal, the burnt, and the creamy. And our brain does this amazing job. It takes all the smells and all the volatiles from the nose and glues them onto what we think we're tasting in the mouth. It's almost like the ventriloquist's dummy illusion. Very powerful, we're not aware that our brain is combining the senses, and yet it is taking the 70 to 95% of what we think we taste, we really uh, smell instead. So this is the oral uh, referral. Um, and I, something I, th I think that is, is important. We all know it's true when we have a cold and our nose is blocked. And what do we say? Food loses its taste. It does not lose its taste. Your taste buds are working fine. What you lose is the smell, but it's the illusion that our brain plays on us. And if that is true, which I think it is, that the majority of what we think we taste we actually smell, then it sort of makes lots of design decisions kind of bizarre in hindsight. If we take something like uh, coffee, if most of the pleasure and most of the taste comes from the nose, what am I doing serving millions of cups of coffee with a taste slot but no Especially bizarre when you think that coffee is probably the universally most liked smell, along with chocolate. Whether or not you like the coffee, you probably like the smell of coffee. Um, and what's more, for many people, the pleasure of coffee, quite often it's, you know, the freshly ground coffee smells wonderful, but when I swallow it, sometimes I'm a bit disappointed by the taste or the flavor. So in the world of coffee, you have the world's best smell that smells best orthonasally as we inhale and what most coffee cup lids uh, singularly do not let you do is sort of smell uh, the thing. So that seems like bad design and something that could be uh, improved upon. Other examples of the bad design you might think are the drinks bottles. Again, I can smell the drink or I can taste the drink, but I can't do both things simultaneously. Or, or, or restaurant meals, you think if 70 to 95% of the taste comes from the smell and the dish is coming from the kitchen with all the steaming, volatile, rich air coming off the food, I'm losing it, I'm missing it. So maybe we should bring back the cloche that reveals the aroma at the table. Maybe we should come back with the old Steiner beer mugs with the lid, popular in Germany, that allow you to enjoy the aroma of the beer. Or maybe we should have more of the bowl food, because by eating from a bowl and bringing the bowl up to your face, you increase the olfactory component, and hence, I think, the pleasure of the dish. So in some work, we're trying to create soup bowls that fall over with a round bottom. A crazy idea, except that it will force you to hold the bowl in your hand, and hence, you'll get more of the olfactory hit and probably more of the enjoyment uh, uh, too. Through other sorts of designs one might think of, um, maybe this kind of lid for a can makes sense if I'm trying to design for smell, for the silent 75%. Or maybe it makes sense of some of the patents that one finds from PepsiCo over the last five years or so, as they're now trying to impregnate the seal or the lip of the bottle um, with uh, volatiles, so that when you twist the lid, you may break the capsules, release the scent, and you taste the drink, and you think you're tasting it, but you're really smelling the outside, the volatiles laid on the outside, but your brain combines product and pack into one experience. And maybe this way, it allows you to deliver more flavor more cheaply, because it's kind of bizarre, you sort of swallow the flavor and it's gone, but maybe the flavor, the aroma around the rim will be there from start to finish and isn't uh, wasted uh, on you. That's the idea. Um, uh, 
the challenge or the danger is that uh, it, it, it doesn't always work. As shown by this example, the right cup launched last year, a cup um, where you can pour water in and it gives you a flavored drink, is the idea. Uh, how so? Well, you've got a plastic insert in the cup that is impregnated with fragrance uh, you using color, because we know color is important, and you pour um, water into the glass, and then it tastes almost like orange juice in the orange glass, and almost like apple juice. Not quite, in fact. It really tastes thin and synthetic to me. Uh, nothing at all like real orange juice. But at least an interesting idea to think about how you may design differently and bring some of the flavor of food and drink, not from the liquid or the food inside, but from the packaging uh, on the outside uh, instead. Uh, and that notion here in the world of food and drink, of course, extends out uh, to many other packaged goods, be it the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, air vent in the front of your coffee. Again, good design delivering to your nostrils when you pick up the bag or one of my favorites from the washing laundry detergents, that you open one of these packs and it smells so intense, the smell signifying cleaning ability. Apart from when you pick up one of the tabs, they smell of nothing. They are perfectly hermetically sealed. You can have one of these boxes empty for weeks, and every time you open it, it still smells really strong, really cleaning. And in fact, in this case, they have the fragrance embedded in the glue seal at the back so each and every time you open the lid, you squish a few more of those aromatic uh, particles, release a scent, and again, we as consumers are kind of stupid. We open the lid, we smell, and we think the smell must be coming from the product, but maybe it's from the pack, the cup, or in some cases, the fragranced um, uh, uh, cutlery uh, instead. Mm -hmm. um, and here, one other example of then the challenges and the potential, if you're selling frozen chocolate products, like a, a chocolate-covered ice cream, for example, we've got chocolate, one of the world's top two most pleasurable smells, and yet when you freeze chocolate, it doesn't smell of anything at all. Uh, so what's to be done? Well, there is, has been some work here uh, embedding chocolate aroma in the seal at the end of the packaging, so you get your chocolate ice cream from the freezer, your Mars ice cream bar, you open the packaging, you smell the wonderful chocolate, and again, we're sort of fooled. We think the smell comes from the chocolate, but really embedded in the packaging. I stress there's sort of challenges about getting an authentic chocolate smell from the pack, um, but maybe it is uh, possible. Okay. And then we have a little bit of the touch of packaging, the feel of the thing. Uh, that can be the weight of packaging. It can be the texture. It might be the shape. Um, it might be the compressibility. All the parts of our experience, product in pack, and all, I think, uh, have some impact. And what a lot of our work is doing is trying to almost uh, represent the product through the packaging, building on the kind of the classic old lemon juice, Jif lemon. This sort of feels cheap and nasty today, but it has the shape of the lemon and kind of the texture uh, of the lemon. But what more could we do to convey uh, the, the product inside through the textured um, uh, lid? Here are a few other examples. That One that we worked on with Starbucks. Uh, trying to allow the consumer to feel the ultra-fine grind of the coffee through uh, the packaging. So either the feel of the pack or the feel of the product, both are possible. Others doing it, Godiva, a few years ago, selling the silky chocolate, but then coating their chocolate box with a sort of silky feel, a silky finish, in order to have a congruency between what you feel um, and what you taste. Up to the ultimate, I think, high end of product design for the Japanese uh, Naoto Fukusawa, 
these are amazing, hyper-realistic uh, banana skin, uh, uh, um, what do you call it? Kiwi fruit or strawberry. And these were in the uh, um, architecture school in London a few years ago to feel and just a you know, perfect rendition of the texture of those things. Probably expensive and perhaps too expensive for many uh, mass market products, but we've been doing the research behind the scenes to show how banana juice, banana milkshake tastes more banana y if it's eaten drunk from a container that feels like a banana rather than some sort of horrible plastic or tetra pack container uh, instead. And if we're serving a, 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 a fruit tea, say a Lipton's fruit tea, then maybe we want to treat the label to give the peach tea the, peel, the feel of peach fuzz to create a signature touch and one that delivers a functional uh, 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 benefit uh, to uh, pack. Uh, and this may be my, one of my favorite examples in the space from Heineken, uh, a pack that now we can look at in many levels from the angular red star. Through they had tactile paint, so creating a point of differentiation. This is the only beer can that felt different in the hands with your eyes closed. Um, but this tactile paint was asymmetrically distributed over the can surface. Not all of the can had the paint on, and I suspect that was designed to kind of make the consumer hold the can in a certain position and hence show the star in front vision, not at the side or the back uh, instead. But sort of tactile marketing, also with um, a bit of a benefit perhaps for uh, the brand or for product uh, perception. Which brings us to, uh, what does it really do? What does it really matter what the texture of your packaging is? So here we have some, what are supposed to be Italian ginger biscuits. But I have to say they're nothing like English ginger nuts or ginger biscuits. <laughs> uh, kind of a, a, a pale rendition. But nevertheless, we'll have a go. And if, if the ginger biscuit doesn't work, we have some uh, candied ginger in the cup on the top. And on the, the table, you should have uh, some sandpaper and some uh, velvety, kind of soft, furry material. And what we've been doing in Oxford, and as a subject of this paper, is giving people ginger biscuits and getting them to taste the ginger biscuit while they feel the sandpaper, and while they feel the fabric. So I'd encourage you to try a ginger biscuit, try some crystallized ginger, and see whether anything in your tasting experience changes as a function of which surface you feel. Thank you. Oh. No. <laughs> or maybe a sandwich of the two, kind of some, some crystallized ginger and a bit of biscuit at the same time. Uh, so here we are, in fact, kind of we're back with the Italian futurists yet again. We're in the world of syntactilismo, as Marinetti called it in the futurist cookbook, when he would have his uh, tactile dinner parties, inviting people to eat without the aid of knife and fork, burrowing their face into the plate while at the same time feeling their neighbor's clothing to see whether it changed the taste. This 1930s in um, Milan and elsewhere, syntactilismo, Marinetti and his colleagues thought of this connection between touching and tasting as, I guess, a form of synesthesia. And as I've said, I don't believe that's the right way to think. I think there is a connection here. And what we find in our research, if we give people textured plates or the sandpaper, 
give them ginger biscuits. Seems to work especially well. The sort of sandpaper seems to bring out the pungency of the ginger. And if you've got a proper, a real, an English ginger biscuit, it also brings out something of the biscuitiness of the biscuit. Makes no sense, it shouldn't happen. And yet the majority of people do feel some change in their experience here when I'm tasting the biscuit and a bit more of this. Um, with things that are completely unconnected. So as soon as you put the rough texture on plateware that you're eating the biscuits from, suddenly you get a, maybe an enhanced interaction. Your brain has more reason to believe that what I'm feeling is linked to what I am uh, tasting. And this done with um, ginger biscuits, um, we've recently published in the world of wine. Uh, we can bring out the tannins and the astringency of wine with the sandpaper too. So there are certain taste qualities that I think can be accentuated. In the case of ginger, I like ginger, so it's better for me with the sandpaper. But I'm not so sure I like astringency in wine, so maybe it's a bad thing there. In both cases, the texture we feel is associated and changes uh, what we taste. Um, but whether it's good or bad kind of uh, depends. And with this insight in hand, that what we feel, the texture, can change the taste, then you can start having lots of fun with 3D printing of receptacles. This work from colleagues in um, Trest, I think, um, or the Netherlands, uh, with 3D printed cups with rounded outer side, with a textured angular outer side, and putting a drink in the rounder cup makes drinks taste sweeter just like making things rounder in shape, and they've published uh, on uh, this recently, through to sort of the more, bet the more highly designed cases. This from Bar Artesian in London, uh, often voted the world's top cocktail bar, and when I see a receptacle like that, I can really imagine what impact it has, both its overall macro geometric shape, but also all those small round bumps on the outside, so sort of beautifully designed uh, um, receptacle that can, in the hands of a good cocktail maker, hopefully uh, accentuate something in, uh, in, in, in the taste. Throw a couple of other examples here of, um, uh, uh, of the shape and the design, and maybe of no interest much to anybody today, but this from 1991, really advanced, I think, work from Delft, from the design school there, uh, having the students design different sort of packaging forms or shapes, and even without any other information showing over a quarter of a century ago that we have expectations of taste, of acidity or creaminess based just on the dish uh, in a sort of abstract way. This done intuitively, but today we're bringing the design uh, element in with science, the measurement science, and an understanding of where in the brain the texture and the taste uh, come together. And beyond that, we have weight uh, in the tactile. Uh, and for me, uh, one might think of super Tuscan wines, in particular, who seem to be using very heavy wine bottles. Something that's noted uh, here in the wine trials uh, guide, that these bogle bottles are hefty, and their weight is a nice feature. One that often tricks people into make, thinking the wine is more expensive than it really is. So some winemakers are investing in heavy bottles. Super Tuscans are known for this, using very heavy glass bottles. Um, what impact does it have? Um, well, here's our re results from the Oxford Wine Company store. The most boring experiment we ever did. We spent two days in the wine company store measuring every single bottle from bottom left all the way around to the top right. 681 bottles of wine and weighed them on a scale, uh, looked at the region of origin, the age, the price, grape variety, and so on. Uh, and what we found is this. Uh, there is a correlation in the marketplace in wine bottle packaging that for every extra pound sterling you pay, you get eight grams more glass. All bottles, 750 milliliters. So one pound for eight grams. And hence that makes sense of why sometimes consumers, you see them in the wine store and they wander around and they get a couple of bottles 
And sometimes they kind of do something a bit, a bit like that. Just that will not tell you about the taste of the wine, but what it will do is tell you about subtle differences in weight, and we infer from heavier things uh, being. And that correlation is even stronger. Another product that comes in a uniform size lipstick, where uh, the weight of the packaging is an even better indicator of the price you're going to have to pay, and perhaps uh, the quality uh, of the product. Um, and that probably explains, then, I think, why so many consumers tell us that beer tastes better from bottle than from can, or Coca-Cola. I like it from a Coca-Cola bottle, not from a, uh, a pet bottle or from a can of Coke. It's just not the same tasting experience. Um, but here, back in Edinburgh at the Science Festival, the same batch of beer in the bottle, in the can, and uh, ratings of the taste of the beer significantly higher when you know it came from a bottle that you held. Even if you're drinking it from a glass that you know it came from a heavy bottle, improves taste uh, ratings in a way that we've now extended to boxes of chocolates. You come to the lab, we give you a box of chocolates, take a chocolate and rate it. And if that box of chocolates has a 30 gram weight on the bottom, you will rate the chocolate as better. Add a little weight to the bottom, bottom, bottom of a can of Coke, open it, sip it, rate it, it's better. So weight in packaging again and again seems to connote quality in the tasting uh, experience. Um, both in terms of the quality of the product, your liking of the product, and here from work in Milan, at Milan Bococca, um, with colleagues Elia Gatti uh, and colleagues, we showed um, a bit of the mechanism of weight. So what you're looking at here are 12 bottles. In this case, it's hand washing solution, uh, seasoned with dragon's blood fragrance. And people came into the lab, they had to open each of the 12 bottles, sniff the contents, and then rate the intensity of the fragrance and um, how effective they thought this product would be at cleaning your hands. And you can see we vary the saturation in the color from white to pink to red. And in half of these bottles have a little lead weight submerged in them. You can't see it, but it feels heavier. And what we find is that people's rating of the intensity of the fragrance of the efficacy of the product is higher in the red bottles than the pink or the white, uh, and also in the heavier bottles as compared to the lighter bottles. So the weight in the hand is a key part of the experience of the product, and maybe why when I hand out um, this perfume here, I'm going to try and sniff and, uh, and share, and think about the quality of that and how much you might pay. Um, you know, it's probably no coincidence that most perfume bottles, most aftershave bottles, come in very heavy glass. Perhaps once that was for preservation purposes, but today I think it's part of the experience. And the heavier the bottle, the, the brighter the color, the more intense uh, the fragrance. So here we've got a, a fragrance uh, from a colleague, a perfume maker in uh, London. And when I hand this out in the business in, uh, in Bogota and ask people what it smells like, do you like it, and how much would you pay for a bottle like that, then uh, often people say, um, kind of a toilet cleaner sort of reminds me of. Uh, uh, I don't really like it that much, and I might pay 30 pounds a bottle for a bottle of perfume like that. In fact, if you see the label, it's from a, a Roger Dove, who's the world's most expensive perfumier, and a bottle of that really costs two to three thousand pounds sterling for that amount. So please don't drop, <laughs> please don't drop it. Um, but the, but but, the, but you, you cannot evaluate that fragrance, I think, in the metal canister that it comes from the factory, say. But you need to do it in the heavy glass container uh, to really enjoy it and experience it as the consumer uh, will. And if you can't, because we're all being told you must light your packaging. We can't have all this packaging waste. It's crazy to ship those heavy two and a half kilo glass bottles around the world. Uh, we need to lightweight. 
what can we do? Well, here's one idea, um, is not to play with the weight of the main body of the packaging, but to play with the weight of the cap. Because each time you open the bottle, you may take the cap off, and that cap can be heavier or lighter than you think. This is a horribly cheap plastic thing. It comes off a very low quality experience. This is a, a something else altogether. Um, and so in our work with perfume makers, but also with cognac, whiskey, uh, high value spirits, those people who are selling you know, cognac in the Far East at $3,000 a bottle to people with no history of, of necessarily whiskey tasting or cognac tasting, then we're, we're creating uh, caps that are really heavy, that are much heavier than you expect. And so each time you remove the lid from the bottle, you go, wow, that's heavier than I expect. A small amount of the total weight giving rise to this heavier than expected feeling that uh, seems to convey. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and we will leave the, the touch then with the texture, with the compressibility, with the weight. Uh, well, I'll show you this, which was launched at Euro Cucina in May this year, here in Milan. Um, the first range of plateware uh, developed based on the neurogastronomy and the gastrophysics research, uh, together with Nef Kitchens and made by um, uh, Raiko Kaneko, who's a Japanese uh, potter um, in the Midlands of the UK. And she created these three amazing uh, plates. Uh, we have the one for the seafood with the whites and the blues, the sweet dessert plate with the round uh, 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 form, the pinkish uh, white colors, color of sweetness, and this, the plate for the um, Thai green curry. So a plate that is heavy, uh, but also the underside of this plate is textured just like the sandpaper, very rough in order to bring out the gingery notes. Now, these might not be the perfect solution, um, but I think they are the first example of plateware uh, being made based on the science. They've got, to be in, they've got to be interpreted and made into something that looks beautiful, hopefully, and that may last and fit. Uh, but I think we're going to see a lot more of this kind of science-based uh, design um, moving forward. And uh, uh, the other example will be uh, innovation in the cutlery that we eat with. Here from work in Oxford of um, serving a, uh, a hare or rabbit stew with the hair, the pelt of the animal tied onto my wife's um, Christoph uh, silver service. Uh, a very different tasting experience. You know what you're eating you're connected by the smell and the feel to the animal whose life has been lost. There were no <laughs> plates were emptied that night. Uh, you're more mindful eating. And we tried that first there in Oxford. We tried it in cafeterias, serving people food in a restaurant with a heavy fork. And they say the food tastes better. They're willing to pay more for it. So that sort of helps you to explain this. The spoon, that is served to diners as the final course on the tasting menu at what was the world's best restaurant, um, the Fat Duck. Uh, the plate itself um, may be levitating, spinning in midair over the table. And this spoon, we can all imagine how much effort we would have to put in to pick up that spoon. Our brains are simulating the act of, um, of touching it. And yet, in this case, there are lead weights embedded in the handle, so it's heavier than you expect, hence conveying quality. Um, and it's also textured to change the tasting experience. And we've also embedded, oh sorry, the Fat Duck have embedded fragrance into the handle. The fragrance of heliotropin flower, the fragrance of base, the fragrance that you sort of, if I give it to you now, you say, mm, familiar, I like it. Your heart rate will probably go down as you relax. Not quite sure why. And this dish is all about going to sleep. It's the end of the meal, at the end of 20 courses, and it's all about uh, it's, you know, dreamy and counting sheep. Uh, but we're using the weight and the texture. This, again, is not a perfect thing, but it illustrates how some of the world's top food producers, the chefs, are now incorporating the ideas from the science papers in order to try and enhance 
the design, the memorability, the shareability, and perhaps the Instagrammability uh, of uh, their dishes. Okay, we should leave that. <sighs> what are we doing? Chairs. Maybe it's time for a potato chip. We haven't really looked at sound yet. Uh, but I think sound is key. It's a forgotten flavor sense. When you ask people about food, I think the taste is important. Maybe I think the color is important. Now I know the smell is important. But no one really thinks about the sound. Uh, and yet, there is sort of a, a question that appeared as the title of a paper in Science, the top science journal in 2001. Why does nobody like a soggy crisp? Because a soggy crisp uh, has all the, 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 the nutritional content of a fresh crisp, chemically identical, and yet it's not desirable. Um, so maybe in trying your potato chip, not stale, I should say, because um, no one likes a soggy, stale crisp. But think about where your pleasure resides in that tasting experience. And I think a lot of it is in the sound of the crunch. Uh, and we can demonstrate that uh, in the lab here with Max Zampini, um, Italian psychologist who was in Oxford. When we gave our hungry undergraduates, the weirdos, uh, two tubes of Pringles to taste. That's two of these, about 180 uh, potato chips. And each time they bit into a, a potato chip, we picked up the sound and amplified it or changed it in real time and then played it back over headphones. And what we were able to show, and what we won the Ig Nobel Prize for nutrition for in 2008, is that if you make the crunching sounds louder, uh, the rated freshness and liking of the potato chip goes up. So the noisier the crisp, uh, the more enjoyable uh, the taste. Not only that, we can boost just certain frequencies uh, and uh, just a two to five kilohertz and improve uh, the taste. Uh, and this now, this idea that we can play with the sound of our noisy products, the crisp, the crunchy, the crackly, even the creamy, the squeaky, the snappy food, the carbonated, uh, and find out what consumers like to hear, because they like to hear something, uh, and then go to our development kitchens and ask them, can you make this? Can you bake it? Can you create it? Is now an approach that's been taken up in-house by Unilever, by Nestle, and by P&G. It comes straight from the field of psychology, but helps these companies to virtually prototype new uh, 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 foods. Others have taken the research on the importance of sound and tried to develop apps, sensory apps, to say if you're having a party and you realize you don't have any fresh potato chips, only the stale ones, download the Evercrisp app, put the earbuds in, and they can bring back the freshness every time. Really exists from Evercrisp in Japan. Unfortunately, they have a license, so you can't actually download it, but a nice idea of technology uh, being brought to the table. Or, uh, it's not just the crisp, of course, that makes the noise. It's the pack. Why are noisy foods sold in noisy packages? I used to think it was for some sort of you know, preservation reasons, but in fact, my packaging design colleagues say no. It was just intuitively back in the 1920s when the first potato chips were sold in individual portions. Some clever marketeer intuited the food is a noisy pack. And we've done the research with the chef in Oxford uh, to show that if I give you a potato chip to taste and I play the rattling sound at the same time, that noise makes this crisp taste crisper and crunchier. So that gets you to this, the world's noisiest ever. Over 100 decibels of packaging noise 
when you just hold the Sunship pack. This was launched in the States, uh, I think, about five years ago. Um, it's all meant to be about biodegradable packaging, good for the environment. But you think, is it any coincidence the noisy food is put in the noisiest possible packaging? It was so noisy, in fact, that consumers complained uh, and then uh, Frito-Lay were forced to send out earplugs. You bought the crisp packet. If it's too noisy, we'll send you the earplugs to put in before you eat the crisps. And when that predictably uh, did not work, uh, they were forced to withdraw the packaging sale. I have two of these packs in my office in Oxford, and you've never heard anything like it, and probably never will again. Too loud, I think, uh, but nevertheless, uh, interesting to see how not just the sight, the feel, but also now the sound of packaging is being designed in to deliver a particular functional benefit, be it capturing our attention or making the taste um, a little uh, better. So what have we got here? All the things we eat probably make a sound. That, the sound of Krug champagne, uh, which I think sounds better than, um, if I play, how about this one? We've got, not such a pleasant drink sound. That's the uh, sparkling water. Then we have the Prosecco sound. All sound subtly different. We don't think we can tell the difference. Probably we can, and we've done the research to show that you can. We've done the research to show that this is the most pleasant sound, the champagne, that Krug champagne sounds distinctly different um, and better than other champagnes. And hence, uh, or, uh, Krug then developed this, the Krug shell, as a limited edition, the idea being uh, that you uh, pour uh, the champagne into the glass, then put your Krug shell over the top, bring it to your ear, and you can hear the sound of your Krug champagne before tasting, almost a bit like the seashell at uh, the seaside. So many sounds. Everything we eat or drink is probably preceded by an opening, a preparation, a pouring. Um, and this is work uh, that we did with the, um, with the Cork Confederation in Portugal, uh, showing that when we give people a glass of wine, uh, if they hear a cork pop, they rate that wine as tasting better um, in quality. Um, and more appropriate for celebration than if we serve them, and these are wine writers, wine critics, and wine judges, uh, same wine, but from a screw bottle, from a screw top bottle. This is just the imaging mold idea again of the wine in the bag in the box or the bottle, but image mold can be presented through the sound of the packaging, and it does have an impact even uh, on the experts. The Australians, of course, were furious. They hated this research because most of their wine is in a screw. Uh, so, you know, unfounded, this is unscientific, but it is published and peer reviewed. Uh, and I think there's truth to it that that sound is a very powerful sound uh, associated with celebration and so can be used in a way that um, Alma Wheeler would have been very happy with. Another of the early marketeers whose strap line was um, uh, don't sell the steak, sell the sizzle. Sell the sound of the preparation. The steak sizzling on the hot plate captures attention and is part uh, of the experience. He knew intuitively, uh, but now we are um, uh, bringing... This is the coffee pot at work. Listen to it, Bert. gets darker and stronger. Smell the honest coffee smell. Ah, smell it. But will this cup of coffee taste as good as it smells? You bet it will because it's Maxwell House. The coffee that tastes as good as it smells every time. 
Maxwell House coffee tastes as good as it smells every time. If you like to look at good coffee, listen to good coffee, smell good coffee, and taste good coffee, brew so there it is, yeah, what, 50, 60 years ago? And he thought of coffee as being a sort of si uh, just a, a not very multi sensory product, but we've got the advertisers drawing your attention to the sound of the coffee, the sight of the coffee, the smell of the coffee, and taste of good coffee, uh, intuitively. But this is the modern rendition in part of that uh, the Vend coffee machine, the Marlowe, which you can find in uh, airports and service stations in the UK. And that which is based, which is designed, which has the sound of the coffee shop playing when you order, buy a vended coffee, which releases the scent, that delicious scent of coffee out of the front of the machine. And that also has thought about the sound of uh, the machinery uh, as this machine is in work. So a multi-sensory coffee maker in the high street. Most consumers will not realize the science that's gone into the design but it is there uh, uh, non, uh, uh, nonetheless. Um, coffee, could, I guess, can be noisier. It can be quieter. Um, or it could sound like this. I won't tell you how many coffee machines. <laughs> Something like between a maker and a reversing truck, I think that one. Um, here we go, the Gino. So we recorded about 15 different uh, uh, commercial coffee makers. Some look more attractive than others. Uh, but I think in that sound of preparation of coffee, there's full of detail. And you might like the sound or not like the sound, but every cup of coffee that comes out of this machine is preceded by that sound or uh, a different one. And it turns out that those sounds of grinding, of dripping, uh, do expectations like of the cork. And hence, in the work that's gone on in Oxford, we have been taking um, espresso, uh, bringing people into the lab. Would you like a coffee? You make them a coffee in either this machine or the other machine. You then taste the coffee and rate the coffee, how harsh uh, or enjoyable um, the taste. Half the people have the coffee made from that machine. The other half uh, have it from this machine. Looks the same. The coffee is the same, uh, but... The sound is subtly different. We played with the insides of the machine. A little bit harsher, a little bit higher pitched sound. Everyone gets the same coffee. All that differs is the sound of preparation of that coffee. And with a couple of hundred coffee drinkers, we can show that their ratings of the coffee are different as a function just of the sound uh, of uh, preparation. Okay. And from there, we can jump to not the sound of preparation, but the sound of advertising of uh, our products. So here we've got coffee advert from the 1970s, I guess. Um, and we can take off-the-shelf adverts for food or drinks products and then manipulate them. So we look at this and think about the drink of coffee that is uh, being made. Sorry. Sally, have you got your coat on? It's not cold. Bye. Bye. I reckon we've got about half an hour. I like your thinking. You do? You get the ladder, I'll get the filler. Hearing the sound of the pouring of the drink. That was the original ad. Uh, and here we've got the modified one. Sally, have you got your coat on? It's not cold. Bye. Bye. Maybe we can hear the sort of elevation in the pitch of the sound track in this case. And by changing uh, the sound of the drink as it's being poured into the glass, 
we can give the impression of a hot drink, a cold drink, a hotter than hot drink, or a colder than cold drink. We can caricature uh, the sounds of products, packaging, or the making of food and drink in order to convey, in this case, you want a hot drink on a cold day, maybe if you're trying to advertise champagne in uh, one of the airlines, you might want something that's very cold instead, and we have these caricatured uh, filters that we can put over the adverts to uh, change. <laughs> Which then brings us to this, how the high end, the Formula One, take the sound and its impact on tasting. This, the signature dish at the Fat Duck, the world's top restaurant, has been the signature dish for a decade now. It's still there today. Uh, the sound of the sea that comes looking like sashimi, sand, foam, seaweed, a uh, conch shell, an MP3 player. Diners in the restaurant put the earbuds in and they hear the sounds of the sea before they taste the dish. The sound is the forgotten flavor sense. Uh, and here we've done the research with the chef to demonstrate that seafood tastes significantly better with the sound of the sea than with modern jazz or restaurant cutlery uh, noises or anything else. And I think this is one of the first examples. It was on the menu in 2007, late 2007, one of the first examples of technology brought to the dining table in order to enhance the experience. Here, a three Michelin star chef building on the science to deliver the best food he can, but also a best total experience. And when diners put this in, they're silent. You have tables who've got their, for their once in a lifetime meal. They're really excited, they're talking, they're distracted. They put the earbuds in and for five minutes, everyone is silent. They're thinking about the food, they're mindful, they're attentive. Does this sound really sound like my childhood? Does it really change the taste of the food? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but there's a mindful connection and attentive attention to the food that I think makes it more memorable uh, and uh, enjoyable. And this from 2007, we thought it was the first, playing the sounds of the sea to make the food taste different. But of course, we can go back to uh, the Futurist cookbook and find that here uh, in Italy, back in the 1930s, Marinetti was serving dinners of frog's legs while his diner's ears were accosted by the sound of a, uh, a, a frog. So an old idea done in the 30s, again, to kind of discombobulate diners, done today to enhance the tasting uh, experience. Uh, and it's something that's kind of gone global now, I think, in many of those top Michelin-starred, uh, San Pellegrino, top 50, world's best restaurants. You find things like this. Um, this, my colleague Joseph Youssef, serving a jellyfish dish. So a sustainable, healthy food with lots of crunch, but no flavor. Uh, you're eating it with projection mapping on the table, with the sight of the sea and the waves. You've got the headphones on. You hear the gloop, 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 gloop of the water, but you also hear the periodic <laughs> crunch. And as you're crunching on the food, sometimes you crunch and the headphones play the crunch at about the same time. And then your brain sort of puts it together. It says, That's, that must have been me crunching. Other times you crunch and you hear nothing, or you hear crunching, but you're not doing anything, and your brain pulls these things apart. So there's a really interesting kind of a psychological effect here, I think, uh, of your brain gluing together, segregating, gluing together, segregating the environmental sounds uh, with um, the, the food sounds. And done again with this sort of sustainability message, jellyfish. The Mediterranean is full of jellyfish. There is one Italian chef now, I think, who's, who's doing jellyfish sashimi to try and get rid of some of them. Um, but it is a sustainable food, uh, a healthy food, a food that there's going to be a lot more of as global temperatures rise. And yet it is a food that we in the West are unfamiliar with and may not have eaten. But hopefully in the hands of a top chef, engaging all the senses, uh, you can deliver something that is um, uh, more. Uh, uh, and that 
is in the Fat Duck. It's in Joseph Yusef. It's in Shanghai, in uh, Chef Paul Paré, serving a, um, uh, a fish and chips inspired dish. Fish and chips were English creation. Maybe they're Venetian, but we think of them as English in England. And here, he's serving this dish, and it comes to the table with the sounds of the sea, followed by the sounds of the Beatles, quintessentially British pop group. He projects the British flag onto the table, and then if you still weren't sure where you are, he projects the British weather onto the wall in his restaurant. And for each and every course, the projections change, the music changes, perhaps the temperature changes, the outfits of the waiters and waitresses change. This is total design, both on and off the plate. The chef, Paul, when you speak to him, he's really all about the food. French chef, and it's all about beautiful food, uh, presented à point. But he uses the technology and the design here in order to kind of sequence the meal and make sure the diners are at the right point for the food. So it's technology in the aid of uh, excellence in uh, uh, cuisine. <sighs> But how much does it really matter? When the chefs are doing it, they're playing the sounds of the sea, they're playing the Beatles, they're projecting the British weather. Uh, well, that was a question we set ourselves to address, not in a fancy restaurant. Yes. In Shanghai, in Paul Paré's restaurant, it's 900 euros a person. And I would need 80, 100 people to get a significant result. So that's a very expensive experiment to do. So I think the chefs are onto something, but we can't measure in their restaurant. So instead, we've been doing a lot of experiential events, like the one you see here um, from London, where together with the Singleton Whiskey, and we have 500 people who come to a studio in London. We give them a glass of whiskey, uh, and then, uh, we take them through three environments. Uh, they start off in a grassy room, and we ask them, what does the whiskey smell like? What does it taste like? And what is the aftertaste like? We have the sound of the English summer. We have grass, deck chairs, croquet hoops, green lighting, and plants. How grassy does the whiskey smell? How sweet does it taste? and how textured the aftertaste on swallowing. This is a questionnaire that 500 people had, a 15-minute experience, one glass of whiskey, one scorecard, how grassy the whiskey, how sweet, how woody, in the green room, then in the with red lights and red, pink, colors of sweetness, with the shapes of sweetness, everything in this room is round and sweet, with the tinkling high-pitched sounds coming from high up in space, because that's a sweet sound. Uh, tell me about the nose, the taste, the texture. And finally, into the woody room, we've got stressed wood on the walls and on the floors, the sound of double bass, the sound of creaking wood doors closing, the sound of wood in the fireplace. Everything woody we could think of and again, with your whiskey and your scorecard, tell me the nose, the taste, and the uh, aftertaste. What do we find? 500 people, three nights in central London. The room changes the taste of the whiskey significantly. In the grassy room, the grassy nose of the whiskey is more apparent. In the sweet room, we bring out the sweet taste of the whiskey. And in the woody room, we can bring out the textured finish of the aftertaste. The whiskey has not left your hand, but you can see from your scorecard, I said different things. So this is kind of taking the Provencal Rosé paradox um, and putting it into a 15-minute experience. And the people who were there, the chefs uh, and the restaurateurs, some of them really liked the whiskey woody room, and they left the experience and in restaurants like Long Clune, they started serving their whiskey to their guests off a wooden tray, trying to capture a bit of this woody room experience. And this idea of sensoriums, 
or sensploration is one that has now uh, gone across uh, many, many different uh, brands, from whiskey to coffee to vodka to champagne to wine. We've done 3,000 people wine tasting in London with Campo Viejo wine, so the same wine, changing the lights red, turning them green, playing sweet music, playing sour music, uh, and uh, the tasting experience is different. Uh, and I think consumers are hungry for this, this kind of new kind of interaction with a product. Um, we see others doing it with chocolate as well. So I think it's going from the, from the drinks industry to other food products, uh, this recognition that the environment in which we taste changes the taste, just like the packaging did. And we can optimize it, work with design to create innovative, experiential, and multi-sensory uh, uh, environments. So, I suppose we should pass out some wine. Uh, and on our way to that, I will just... Uh, I'll just show you this one. Uh, here we go. Uh, as the wine is coming out, again, don't drink it just yet. I just want to give you two of the current examples that appeared in, in the Republica today of our work on this sort of experiential design. Um, here in the home of Gestaltists, I hear from a few decades ago. Uh, this one of the dishes that we're working on with Chef Joseph Youssef that involved visual design, auditory, sound design, and food design with a bit of the psychology. Based on this, a, um, what looks like black and white dots. Uh, a classic image from the vision perception textbooks. Looks like black and white dots. And then at some point, you get emergence. And what you should see in the picture is a dog sniffing the leaves in the grass. One leg here, another leg, and the head sniffing down. So it's like a Dalmatian dog in a park. And at first you can't see it, it's just noise and then something emerges. It's the phenomenon of emergence. And you don't see a dog's leg and think, what is that leg attached to? I wonder. You see the whole dog in an instant. There's a sudden instantaneous emergence of a dog. So this is one of the Gestaltist principles of emergence. Um, and uh, if now, once you've seen the dog, you do not see this picture for 10, 20, or 30 years, as soon as you see the image again, you will immediately see the dog. Your brain has changed irrevocably in an instant. So I said, well, wouldn't it be interesting to do the flavor somehow? Uh, and I passed the, the dish, the picture, to the chef, Joseph Youssef, and he came up with this, emergence from the plate of food. In a dish that's called the Picasso dish, hopefully you agree it's kind of Instagram worthy, it's sort of a beautiful image of a plate of food, with beetroot on the right, some duck, and other ingredients. Uh, and before the dish comes out to the diners in the restaurant, it's the only meat course in a nine-course tasting menu. The chef wants you to think carefully. Do you really want meat? And if so, are you sure? So before the dish comes out, um, the chef says, you know, uh, uh, chefs are a bit like artists. And Picasso was famous once for saying, that every act of creation begins with an act of destruction. Uh, and for me, as, a sh as a, an artist, as a chef come artist, that resonates. Because for me, to make the food for you, I've got to first destroy the animal to make a beautiful dish like this. And then you, to enjoy the flavors, need to destroy my beautiful plating to enjoy the food. OK, so that's the idea. Uh, sort of chefs as artists. Now I've just got to go and catch your dinner. And off the chef goes to the kitchen. And this comes in in the restaurant. And out comes your plate of food, your duck. Sort of makes people laugh and a bit uncomfortable that. 
a bit too close to the animal whose life has been lost. Um, but that's part of the point, to use sound design to make diners more mindful of what they're eating, to confront the fate uh, of what's on their plate. Uh, then the dish is brought out, and the chef says, OK, uh, before you start, can you see anything in the plate? Can you see any picture? Any person? Can anyone see anything? What can you see? <laughs> so it's just noise to begin with, more or less. Maybe if I um, show you, uh, it's actually Picasso's uh, half silhouette. We've got the nose, the eyes, the mouth, the shoulders, the bald forehead in beetroot. Uh, so can people see Picasso? No, more or less. Uh, so now if you go back to the plate of food, hopefully you can see Picasso's eye staring out at you from the plate. And you get this emergence, um, which is positively valenced. And then once you've seen Picasso, you can never unsee him. Whenever you see this dish again, you're in a different place from those diners who have not tried the food, but hopefully you're also thinking a little bit about where your food came from. It's got visual design, a bit of psychology, and sound design to figure out the right soundscape to go uh, with uh, the Well, this is, which is on the menu currently, again, inspired by the psychology, by the illusion from the 1890s, uh, you'll find in every psychology textbook, uh, Jas Strau's um, duck rabbit illusion. So if you see either of those images, you can probably see a duck with its beak, or you can see a rabbit with its ears sticking out at the back of its head. So this is what's called a bi-stable visual percept. It looks like a duck or a rabbit. And then I can see the duck and the rabbit. And your visual perception should flip back and forward. Some moments it looks like a duck, and then I can see the rabbit, and I can measure that flip in your perception. And our question is, what happens to taste if you're eating the duck rabbit? So here's the version of the dish created by the chef. Uh, a duck and rabbit are sustainable. They go together well in recipes. We've created uh, the duck on the plate. We do the experiments online. Uh, to see which orientation gives rise to the most ambiguous response. Uh, and then that dish is, uh, uh, is served in the restaurant as this, with an ice plate, with a plate that you can turn to change the orientation of the duck and of the rabbit, um, and a scorecard. And we ask people, what do you taste and what do you see? Do you see a duck or a rabbit? We're going to have a, sa a soundtrack to go with the dish. Duck season! Wabbit season! I say it's duck season, and I say fire! So again, a connection to Charles through the cartoon, with sort of playful things, duck or rabbit, duck or rabbit. It's alternating auditorily. Your vision is alternating. Duck, I see rabbit, I see duck. And the question is, what happens in your mouth? or in your mind to the taste of this morsel of food. If taste changes as your eyes tell you a different story, that would be amazing. We have the world's first flavor changing food. If it doesn't, I suspect the results are of more interest to the academic scientists to say our visual perception can change and flip, but our taste is somehow different, it's slow. If we taste one thing, we stay with that taste and we can't change our uh, interpretation. It is ongoing research. Diners at this moment are being served this dish with a scorecard. What did you see? What do you taste? And we'll have the results from the restaurant in the near uh, future. Um, so we all have some wine on uh, the table here. Ah. Uh, so I think I'm going to show you some. Uh, end up with a little bit of sonic seasoning, um, which is, uh, we heard a little bit about this tinkling high-pitched music in the whiskey sensorium. 
We can see things like this, a bit of synesthetic advertising. You can almost tell what that loudspeaker would sound like by the connection with the dripping chocolate. Deep and rich, I think, comes to mind to me. Um, what more can we communicate through music about taste? Uh, Krug, for example, have a sensory app now where you can scan the bottle of Krug uh, with the code number, and then you'll get music to match the taste of the Krug champagne that you have bought. So bringing an extra sense to the taste experience. Many wine writers talk about um, wines in terms of taste, but we wanted to know what's really here and how can we manipulate the taste of food and drink musically. And to illustrate what we have in mind, you should all have a glass of white and of red wine. Uh, and what I'd like you to do is to take a taste of each wine, think about which of the two wines match, matches better to this piece of music. one piece of music. Um, now play something else. And again, taste your wines and think which wine matches or corresponds to If you ask you to raise the glass that matches the music you hear now. Red, 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 red. Not everybody, we've got to walk. Here. Ah. But the majority of people will pick the white wine for the first track. Flutes and clarinets are better with white wine. And that sort of heavier, darker piece of music goes with the red wine. Maybe 90% of people concur with that. You can see a room full of red wine glasses. Uh, for us, the question is, what's going on there? Because the music has no real connection to the wine, and yet we feel a correspondence. We feel some match. And wherein is that match coming from? I think it's, it, it's shared between people. It's been picked up intuitively by wine writers and so on. And our job is to measure it scientifically and then back through sound design to enhance uh, uh, tasting. Um, and that's what we've done with um, uh, the House of Wolf, a London restaurant, where we had a multi-sensory tasting menu. And the relevant thing here is the sound course, the dessert. In collaboration with Condiment Junkie, a sound design agency, uh, we've got the Sonic Cake Pop. Please take out your phone, dial 0845. 680-2419 if you want to make your dessert sweeter. Dial a different telephone number on your mobile technology to bring out the bitterness. Here we have a diner in the restaurant with their technology eating a bittersweet chocolate lolly. And you might think, is that sweet music I'm listening to or, 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 or bitter? Bitter. Uh, that was one track people heard in the restaurant. The other one was this. And again, the people will say that sounds a bit sweeter than the first one. Uh, can't be literally sweeter, but uh, we did the research with the Fat Duck restaurant, with Condiment Junkie, in the test kitchens, in the science lab, to demonstrate we can bring out 5 to 10% sweetness in the chocolate simply by playing the sweet uh, music. And that's something that oops, uh, this place, the Jin Cafe in Beijing, have come out with. Uh, they play sweet music all day long in their cafe with the idea that they can reduce the sugar in their cakes, pastries, and drinks, keep the experience 
in the mind of the taster the same, but hopefully have a little bit less of the unhealthy stuff there. I don't know if this works as a long-term strategy. I only know that sonic seasoning works in the short term, for sure. So I might want to know the long-term question uh, first, but I think it's an interesting uh, development. And one that um, maybe sort of builds up on an older history of, of musical taste associations. I always want to go back to J.S. Bach's um, Coffee Cantata uh, to ask, Do we have? Yeah. Hmm. Maybe that's not going to play for us today. But to ask whether the notes and the instrumentation of the Cafe Cantata do correspond to the taste of coffee as we understand it today or not. Um, and to use those insights as we have done with work with Starbucks, where um, they were starting to sell Starbucks via. Uh, coffee to be drunk at home rather than in the Starbucks store and we worked on this uh, very low-pitched soundscape together with the sound designer so that when people buy the via take it home and drink the coffee the idea is uh, that they download this track and it enhances the coffee tasting uh, experience You might like this music, or you might not, but it's another example of, of the technology of the design being brought together to hopefully deliver a different kind of multi-sensory tasting experience, something that we do at the home and not just in a high-end restaurant, something that we do in the aeroplane and not just in the high-end restaurant. We use this approach with British Airways uh, to develop a sound bites menu for long haul flights that passengers can stick their headphones into the socket in their chair and we had paired musical selections to match the food in the plane, hopefully to enhance the taste through sonic seasoning, but also through uh, semantic matching. So we've got bitter music. We've got sweet tasting music. What else have we got? We've also got sour. This is my favorite one. Perhaps you're a bit old for this, but with young kids, we have some sour tasting sweets. Um, it might work with your white wine as well if you want to try that instead. And I'd encourage you to take a taste of the sour sweet or of your white wine. And my intuition and the empirical evidence would say, this, well, this is the sourest soundscape known to mankind. It is actually um, Argentinian tango music, but has been mathematically transformed by Bruno Mares and colleagues, mathematician and a physicist, um, to have a very sour connotation. We pair it with a sour color, the green, with a sour shape, asymmetric and angular. And if you have something sour tasting to begin with, like the sour tasting sweet or the white wine, it can accentuate the sourness, the sharpness, the acidity in what you're tasting. Not in a good way, I think. It's a less pleasant experience, but at least effective in demonstrating how you can take sound uh, and use it um, for taste. So bitter, sweet, and sour. What else? What other taste attributes might we want? I love spicy food. Uh, I love chili and pasta arrabbiatas and Thai green curries and very spicy stuff. So we've been working with sound designer Steve Keller from IV Audio Branding in Nashville, Tennessee, and a chef, Deb Paquet, in her restaurant Etch in Nashville, Tennessee, serving diners in the restaurant this spicy mango salad uh, while playing this... Spicy soundtrack. Uh, 
And the results show that we can accentuate in the diners, in the restaurant, who only hear that one track, the rated spiciness of the food. Can be a good thing, can be a bad thing, but nevertheless, we can design sounds for specific tastes or mouthfeels. Um, so this, is, I think, is exciting. It involves, again, the science, but also the design to make something that you like the sound of. Um, and that we can extend to this uh, chocolate. And now the creaminess. I like creamy chocolate. That accentuates the creaminess of chocolate. Well, together with Dominic Persune, a Michelin star chocolatier, to the Rolling Stone, who runs the chocolate line in Belgium. Uh, chocolate shop. We have customers tasting chocolates, his chocolates, beautiful Belgian chocolates, while either listening to this, or other customers in his chocolate shop eating his chocolates, listening to the plunky plinky track instead. All you're doing is rate the chocolate, but this is not a creamy track at all. Very uh, and the results show we can accentuate the creaminess of the chocolate first uh, track relative to uh, the second. So we've got spicy, we've got creamy, we've got sweet, we've got sour, we've got bitter, salty sounds. We've got them, but they're a bit harder to get uh, right, uh, sadly. Um, so this is exciting, and there are winemakers, there are wine judges, there are chocolatiers, there are chocolate brands. There are drinks brands who are all interested in this sonic seasoning now. Um, but there is a question. The science helps in the design of the track that improves the taste. But the question is, do consumers want to know that the science was involved? And to address this with Dominic and one of his chocolates, we had people in his chocolate shop eating a chocolate and listening to the music. Vem morena, vem Vem morena, vem samba Everyone gets the chocolate, everyone hears the music. Uh, and what there is, is the story we tell the customer about what the music and chocolate relationship is. Either nothing at all, there's just music, or we say that, you know, this music was the inspiration for the chocolatier to make this chocolate that you are now tasting. He tried to capture the music in chocolate. Or we say there's a scientist somewhere who has proven that this chocolate tastes better with this piece of music. Uh, same chocolate, same music for everyone, but saying science is involved leads to lower ratings. Better say that the music was the inspiration for the chocolate and that gives rise to the most enjoyable sensation. So science is part of the story here, but that does not mean that it necessarily has to be uh, foregrounded. But let me leave you with um, uh, how this works. Again, from the Formula One of chocolatiers, I guess, Dominique, he made the snortable, the inhalable chocolate for Ronnie Wood's 70th birthday party. Uh, those things that start there again do percolate to the mainstream and they help to explain why things like this happened with the mainstream Cadbury's dairy milk uh, in London. The, um, the whiskey. Uh, that one, money pouring. Um, where people got to eat the nine flavors of dairy milk chocolate, the nine different fillings, while listening to the London Contemporary Orchestra with nine pieces of music that had supposedly been sp carefully composed to match the taste of each and every chocolate. So this is chocolate tasting, but it's experiential, it's multi-sensory, it involves sense exploration. There are no right answers, but you're encouraged as a consumer to taste the chocolate, listen to the music, think whether it matches, and whether the chocolate tastes different with the music or um, not. Um, and that, Experience, the multi-sensory tasting experience, starts in the high-end restaurants, goes to the airlines, goes to the mainstream tasting events in London, so it goes through to arts and culture sector now with what a very popular exhibition, the Tate Sensorium, held in London's Tate Art Gallery. Three years ago, 
where we had four paintings from the collection. 2,000 visitors were invited to come and view the four paintings, and each painting had sounds or smells or touch or taste designed to match the chocolate, the painting. So here we have Sir Francis Bacon's Round Hay Park painting, a very expensive piece of work. We have a museum visitor listening to a soundscape, kind of, of um, industrial sounds, and eating a specially formulated gritty chocolate designed to capture, to correspond to something in the visual appearance of the scene. You might love it, you might think it's a good match or not, but interesting to see then how this sort of sense exploration combining the senses in new and innovative ways is being taken up, not only by the big brands, not only by the famous chefs, but also in sort of the arts and culture sector. It raises questions about whether you're allowed to do that to the painting. I guess Sir Francis Bacon did not intend for his painting to be viewed while nibbling on a gritty chocolate or listening to something. Uh, so there's questions about sort of a, a uh, sort of ownership here and so on, but still an interesting and uh, increasingly exciting uh, event. And I will just leave you, I think, with a glass of whiskey. Well, a, a little sniff of whiskey, I think. Um, and our current work taking sound and trying to do new things with it. So we've seen the Singleton Sensorium, that was all about whiskey. But now with Glen Morangi uh, whiskey, we have been looking at um, ASMR, trying to deliver extraordinary experiences while tasting. ASMR is the kind of the, <laughs> the shiver that people get out the back of their neck, kind of electric tingle when they watch a video, often of somebody whispering quietly like that, or, 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 or rattling paper and whispering like that. Um, very bizarre stuff, but there are millions of people watching ASMR, Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response Videos, online to get this relaxing little neck tingle, helps them go to sleep, and a number of brands are trying to ride the ASMR wave and incorporate it into advertising, as we see here from some stills from Glenn Morangi, who based on our research, interviewing ASMR watchers about what triggers worked best. Do you like things close up or far away? Do you like high pitch or low pitch? Do you like texture or smoothness? Do you like things behind you or in front? Uh, we passed those results on to four artists, video artists, who made uh, three different videos designed to match the three different um, Glen Morangis, the Lantana, uh, the Signet, and their other uh, whiskey. And now, hopefully, if you've all got a, a, a whiskey in hand, uh, we can watch one of those videos it works best if you have headphones on and you can hear the sounds coming from inside your head and just behind, but maybe you get a sense, uh, even from the external loudspeakers of... Uh, so. and of course, being Glen Morangi and being a whiskey, the advertising needs to be connected to the place and the taste, uh, and so it has to have a Scottish uh, type of thing. This, are available still on the internet, I believe. So if you have a pair of headphones, I'd encourage you to taste the whiskey uh, and to try uh, at home. Very low frequency sounds, it turned out from our research were key, as well as the tinkling high pitch ones. Close ups, it turned out, were more effective in triggering ASMR, hence the close up views you see here.
So this, I think, is sort of the, the, the current frontier of experiential design, this available to the mass market, this uh, one of the most successful uh, campaigns that Glenn Morangi have run online, uh, extended uh, availability on the internet for, for a lot longer than was initially planned. It works best, to say, as I say, with the headphones on, but does hint at how our growing understanding of the mind of uh, the taster, of the consumer, involving all the senses, how they see, how they feel, how they hear, how they smell, how they touch, um, can be incorporated into the design, I think, of uh, new food forms. But for us, more interestingly, new packaging, new plateware, new cutlery, new glassware, and new ways of communicating online and through experiential events with consumers uh, taking tasting off the plate, out of the glass, into that kind of off the plate, total experience design. That is at the sort of borders of the science and here in these videos, the artists have gone beyond what the science said they could do in some ways, uh, but it is hopefully an enjoyable, intriguing, uh, stimulating approach and one which I believe what you see and feel about what's up here can and does change what we think of tasting in here. And understanding those connections is allowing more companies either obviously and in our full awareness, deliver strange and new, extraordinary tasting experiences, but all too often is also there in the background, the subtle changes in the design uh, that the companies change the tasting experience without, sh say, shouting anything to the consumer, just using it kind of functional design in the background. And I think both have their place. The chefs, the, the um, advertisers maybe want to draw your attention to the strange, the unusual, the extraordinary, whereas some of the food companies and the packaging designers may well have that sitting in the background, just have you tasting the food and drink as you thought you always were, but with a bit of clever design built on sound experimental science in the background. That is, I think, the new gastrophysics, and it is changing the way that we eat and drink. You want to know what's happening first? Look at the high end, look at the Formula One of the kitchen, the Michelin-starred chef, the cocktail makers, the baristas, but a year, in a year or two's time, those innovations in the high street, in our aeroplanes, on the TV, uh, and on our mobile devices, helping to enhance the experience, maybe make it more stimulating, maybe making it healthier, for wanting to engineer and change food experiences, but whatever our end goal, I think knowing about the gastrophysics and the science of mind, the science of the senses, has to be the way to deliver better experience. Thank you.